Good evening. This is the February 15th, 2018 meeting of the Northampton City Council. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the council president. I'll be presiding tonight. Let me first announce that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. It's also being broadcast on Northampton Community Television. We'll start with a period of public comment. It's an opportunity for members of the public to speak on any issue you wish. We ask only that you keep it to three minutes or less. And the other thing to remember is it's your time to speak to us. We don't engage in kind of a back and forth uh, because we need to have things posted on our agenda if we're going to discuss them. So I first, I understand that there are a group of people who wish to comment on the resolution. And it's fine for today if you want to save your comments until we get to that period of time. I think we can create a second public comment period in order to focus uh, those comments on that issue. So you may choose to wait. But I do have a sign-up sheet, and I'm going to go down it. Um, if you are choosing to wait, let me know. And excuse me if I butcher your name. Um, the first person is Lisa Osepowitz. If you would come up and give your name and address for the record, please. Um, my name is Lisa Asapoets. I'm from 23 Golden Drive in Florence. Um, I'm one of, the, one of the original founding members of the Friends of the Sawmill Hills and a former member of the Nonatuck Land Fund. And I feel that I need to mention that I wrote these comments before yesterday's events in South Florida. <clears throat> I'm here to briefly ask you to consider a few things concerning the proposed open space plan that expands hunting into Northampton's conservation areas. The first thing is that what we call hunting is, in fact, gun violence. Uh, it is people armed with guns and other weapons with the object of killing living creatures. By allowing hunting in our open spaces, we are, in effect, sanctioning gun violence in our city's public areas. Another thing that I hope you will consider is that while some people in the city government seem to be moved by the argument that hunters are taxpayers and are being denied their right to shoot and kill in open spaces paid for by their tax dollars. In fact, no one is being denied the right to use these lands. They're not private parks. They are open to everyone for all kinds of passive activities. However, expanded hunting would mean that an arguably larger segment of local taxpayers who use these lands for peaceful recreation will be denied their use for the duration of the hunting season out of concern for being you know, shot, killed, maimed. Um, additionally, taxpayers whose property abuts conservation areas, like my family's, will effectively be denied the peaceful enjoyment of our own backyards during the hunting season. Occasionally, hikers wander accidentally into our backyard after becoming disoriented in the woods. The consequence of someone with a firearm coming close to our property could lead to something much more tragic than giving directions back to the individual's vehicle. While there have been assurances that the areas currently under consideration for hunting in the open space plan are small and remote, I don't believe for one minute that the hunting lobby will stop with that allotment. Year after year, they will ask for more. Besides, can you guarantee that the hunters will stay within the perimeters given? How will those boundaries be enforced? And while I understand that Northampton stands a better chance at grant monies if we allow hunting as part of our open space plan, are we the type of community that will give our open, space, our open spaces to gun violence for some dollars from the state? Are we the type of community that considers shooting and killing to be an acceptable form of recreation? I really, really, really hope not. I urge the Northampton City Council not to approve an open space plan that includes hunting in our conservation areas. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, Marty Nathan, please. Hi, um, I'm Marty Nathan from 24 Massasoit Street. Um, and I spoke on Monday about the um, uh, limitations of response in city council chambers during meetings and would like to repeat that. I really oppose the amendment. I know the amendment was amended and is no longer, that is not what is being proposed, but I, I hope it does, is not uh, revoted and uh, reversed. I really think that what we saw during the um, 
discussion of the surveillance cameras was, though rowdy and chaotic, was democratic and had involved more people than usually uh, come to city council meetings and thus was welcoming to people who usually don't feel welcome here. To have someone, to have a member of the police with a gun and a uniform here making sure that people don't cheer or hold signs would be a terrible deterrent to uh, people expressing themselves, particularly the powerless in our society who are already, so to speak, under the gun in the Trump era. Secondly, I, as a supporter and a doctor for immigrants, I really want to encourage you to pass the resolution that is being proposed to support the um, uh, to support DACA and the Dreamers and uh, those who should have temporary protected status and should be able to remain in this country. We're at a crisis, particularly for the Dreamers who are losing their jobs and being kicked out of school because their status is in question. We as a, a community that's devoted to human rights have to stand up against that and make our voices heard in Washington, even though they seem not to hear anything that comes from reasonable, reasonable mouths. Um, so I thank you uh, to the City Council for entertaining both of these things, and I hope that you do not accept the original amendment um, uh, from the, but instead, accept that from the Legislative Council, and also support immigrants. Thank you very much. Alex Jarrett. Alex Jarrett, 8 High Street, Florence. Um, first, I want to say I'm in support of the resolution to support immigrants and people with temporary protected status. Um, second, I want to talk a little about transportation equity. Um, I've been walking on the sidewalks lately and um, it's been rough um, and I wanted to imagine an alternate few, uh, history where after each storm each property owner was required to clear the road in front of their house and they had 24 hours to do that but the sidewalks were cleared very quickly by trained professionals <laughs> well this would be definitely a disaster but the current which is the opposite of that situation um, is unfair and difficult for sidewalk users. Um, we shouldn't have to wait 24 hours to have safe passage, and after that it's still dangerous as some property owners don't shovel or maintain well. So this has impacts. Um, there's a disproportionate impact to people with less money who can't afford a car, or for people whom it's unsafe to drive, such as undocumented people. Wheelchair users um, <clears throat> have to sometimes ride in the street or use a private vehicle if they have one or rely on van services, which are usually funded by tax dollars. Wheelchair users do use the rail trails that are plowed in the winter, and um, I'm greatly appreciative of the city's plowing of the rail trails for all users. Uh, public transportation. Um, a bus stop is not right at someone's house usually, and their destination is not right at a bus stop. And those with the car will use it more, um, environment, which has environmental impacts, but also health impacts as people don't get regular exercise. Uh, children have to be driven to school instead of being able to walk. So I've been reading the city's complete streets plan, and I actually couldn't find mention of keeping the sidewalks clear of snow and ice in that plan. So I thought I'd research what some other um, communities are doing. Public Burlington, Vermont plows all the sidewalks with small plows, uh, concurrently with street plowing during the day and at night in time for the schools to be open. Amherst has a sidewalk plowing route for major sidewalks and prioritizes sidewalks that facilitate students walking to school. After the initial plowing route is done, residents are required to maintain the sidewalk in a passable condition. Uh, so that seems like sort of a compromise between our, our current uh, how Northampton does things where the property owners are required and a Burlington solution where the city does everything. Um, so I encourage the council to research the benefits and costs of a system similar to Amherst's to bring pedestrian transportation closer to the ease of vehicle transportation in the winter. 
and, um, <clears throat> and make it so any of us, regardless of how we choose to get around, whether it's walking, biking, public transportation, or driving, have equal access to transportation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well timed. Um, Amy Bookbinder, please. Amy Bookbinder, Grove Avenue in Leeds. Um, <clears throat> before I begin my own remarks, I just wanted to say that um, in the past, some of us in the public learned that finger snapping irritates the um, hearing aids of one of the counselors. And as, as we've asked before, I'm going to ask you <coughs> that people not do that. So um, I'm here to support two important items on tonight's agenda, both of which involve our rights as the documented and undocumented public. The first is TPS, Temporary Protected Status, for immigrants under threat of deportation. As I said at our last council meeting, I'm in full support of the TPS resolution, and I want to thank the sponsors and the full council which approved it. And also, I want to thank those here tonight who will be sharing their personal stories in support of the resolution. I'm also here to support the Legislative Matters Committee's rejection of the proposed amendment to the Council's conduct rule. I support a no vote on the amendment to abide with the Committee's recommendation against it. And I believe that going against their recommendation would be inconsistent with past practices of this Council and a rather stunning reversal. The standing rule on conduct says <coughs> counselors and members of the public shall conduct themselves with civility and respect, and I believe that's sufficient. The amendment, which is ostensibly to improve seeing and hearing at council meetings, is neither civil nor respectful of the public's right to free speech, the council's stated commitment to engage citizenry and a democratic process, including open debate with the public's right to indicate respectfully its approval and disapproval. And most importantly, it is not the public's job to make hearing and seeing better at council chambers. I believe it's your responsibility. And I have a few suggestions on how you can do that. But first, I'd like to show you this photo, which illustrates my point. <laughs> Amy Bookbinder, this was from the Gazette. Amy Bookbinder of Northampton strains to listen January 10th, 2018 during a Northampton City Council meeting to address the mayor's veto of its anti-downtown surveillance ordinance. Okay, here are my suggestions. Oh, you're kidding. I have a few long run-on sentences. Can I please finish? I think it would be in the interest of equity if you would maybe email them to me and I would enter them into the record. Would that be okay? So everyone has an no. equal amount of time. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do this as quickly as I can. I'm sorry. I have to insist. I um, appreciate your ideas and your participation, but everyone. Okay, please. Somebody else. Please. Yeah, you could hand to someone else, okay? Thank you very much. The next person signed up is Sarah Field, who may, in fact, read some recommendations. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah Field. I live at 40 Elizabeth Street in Northampton. I'm going to continue where Amy left off. Um, Amy's suggestions, which I support, improve the sound system in the council chambers. Counselors, if you want to be heard, speak into the microphones provided and speak louder. Provide listening devices for members of the public who need them. And replace the current podium blocking the public's view with a shorter one. It's the above problems that make hearing and seeing the council's business difficult, not the public expressing its opinions. Finally, it is uncivil to call members of the public hysterical, politically, cor politically correct, paranoid, uncivil, guilty of cheering and jeering and booing as printed in today's Gazette. 
good grief. We know that distorting the truth and slandering one's opponents have become normalized by Team Trump in our country, but are we going to let that happen here in our city, our sanctuary city? Those of us who take the time to attend city council and participate in civil discourse have a right to not be slandered and a right to free speech, though some on this council might not agree with what we have to say, how we say it, or who we are. I urge you to support TPS and to vote no on the unnecessary, vindictive, and uncivil and disrespectful proposed amendment, which I personally find offensive and an embarrassment to this city council. Those were Amy's words, but I wholly, wholeheartedly agree. And um, I just want to add my perspective that I, I really do believe that I'm very happy that we've started this conversation around access and creating a more welcoming and accessible um, and inclusive um, environment for city council meetings and so I'm excited to continue that conversation. I don't think that silencing free speech is a way to do that. So I urge you to um, veto this amendment and to think about other ways of approaching that um, that question. And I also strongly support the resolution and thank the sponsors and the people who've shown up tonight to speak in support of the resolution regarding uh, TPS. Thank you very much. I think I am having trouble reading the next name, so you'll excuse me when I pronounce it. Uh, Marlene uh, Maya? We to ask, um, Would you like to wait until kind of the next oh, segment? If, or? If, um, could we stay within this portion, but we can be moved down within the same um, block of speakers? That's fine. Group, so, so if you wish to do that, when I call you, just let me know and I'll make a note and come back to you. Okay. Thank Good. You. Thank you. Um, Jesus Castillo? So we're also in the same. same. Um, Emma Munoz. Also in the same group. Okay. <laughs> Irma Munoz. Also in the same group. Blair Gimma. Jimma, excuse me. Well, my name is Blair Jimma, and I live at 3 Clark Avenue. Um, on Monday night, Councillor Nash attempted to justify the amendment to add new and restrictive rules to control public expression in the city council chambers. He passed out examples of rules that other city councils have. It's filled with detailed accounts of how members of the public will be ejected and excluded from meetings, how members will be taken into the hands of armed officers. And so I ask you, Councillor Nash, why did you hand that to me? Why did you approve of sharing this information, Councillor Bidwell, Council Shara? Are you so afraid of our voices that you must silence them with force? And how dare you try to intimidate me? How dare you introduce this amendment immediately after a large group of largely women, largely queer members of the public spoke out against state surveillance? What warranted you giving me a detailed account of armed officers taking people out of city council spaces? I'd like to end by sharing some words by the Latin American philosopher Enrique Dussel. Political power cannot be taken, as in the statement, we will attempt to make a revolution through taking Senate power. Power is held always and only by the political community, the people. The community always will have this power, whether it be weak and threatened or intimidated, such that it cannot be expressed. Those who possess pure force, violence, the exercise of openly despotic or ostensibly legitimate domination have only a fetishized, denatured, and spurious power, which despite being called power, consists instead of a violence that is destructive of the political itself. Totalitarianism is the exercise of power through non-political, through police, or quasi-military means, which cannot awaken in the citizenry, citizenry that strong consensual union of wills motivated by free reasoning and discussion that properly constitutes political power. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Rose, Rose Bookbinder, please. Would you like to wait? Okay. Waiting is fine. Um, Dan Kinsey? Nestled in the corner. We'll give you extra time to get up here. Sure. 
if I know what I want to say. Um, you don't need to do that. Okay. We can hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, Dan Kinsey from Two Round Hill in Haydenville. And I'm in support of what everyone's been saying. Um, <coughs> and I guess the one thing I want to uh, say is that, we're, that the, in the global sense, there's a, uh, a fear and a constriction that's happening everywhere. And that it can ha um, affect all of us almost subconsciously. And that it's really important that we advocate for staying open and staying in, in protection of people's rights and to, to know that we're doing that not just you know for, for this place but that we're, we're part of a, a movement that's throughout the whole world that's happening and that it's really um, of essence that um, that the, the that the sense of being a representative body for the people that 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 we that we honor the power of where the people are coming from and trying to encourage that and it, I'm just I'm not being completely clear but I just want to say that that this is not an easy thing to do and that there's ways in which we can get fearful and close down without even knowing it and so I just want to say that this is a worldwide phenomenon and I think we would uh, it would be behoove us to um, to advocate strongly and, and get more articulate and clear about why um, being open and advocating for openness and connections to the grassroots um, is, a, is an important thing to become a leader in that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Deanna Sierra, also waiting, okay. And then just says Will from Hadley. Yes, sir. <clears throat> you state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Will Meyer. I live at Nine River Drive. Hadley. Um, I wanted to echo one of the first speakers. Uh, yeah, no guns in hunting. I'm not into that. Uh, yes on TPS. Um, and I guess um, I wanted to, to echo the, the idea that, you know, the reason it's hard to hear is because I think the sound system's not very good. The podium's too big. I want to echo whatever Amy said with that. Um, I think Blair had some really good points about um, ab about the the different councils, you know, dragging police officers in to, to take out force. I think it's very telling that uh, Nash handed out that that document the other night. Um, and in order for the proposed language to be enforceable, there would need to be language um, in the amendment that would make it clear that. Um, how, how, it, how it would be enforced, because uh, currently it doesn't necessarily say that it would be to the president's discretion, so that needs to be addressed. But the thing I, I, I wanted to speak about tonight is that if such a conduct amendment was passed, this council would be in line with Republican lawmakers all over the country that are implementing legislative crackdowns um, on dissent. And, and people using their voice, um, and it's like not not a trend to be to be proud of. It's not something to uh, aspire to, in my opinion. Um, we wrote about this in the shoestring um, that one one such bill in North Carolina would make it illegal to heckle politicians. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to. To, to say that and uh, uh, thank you guys and uh, you know which side are you on thank you very much <laughs> and now Ruthie Woodring uh, Ruthie Woodring Florence I, I'm not sure if it's uh, if I want to give my address just because some people may not be I mean it'd be safe for them to give their address so I'm just gonna say Florence and I'm not prepared to speak but I agree with lots of what's been said. Unfortunately, I got a sign coming in the door, so I'll just hold up my sign, which if you can't read it, it says, let's not codify white supremacy culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to return. <laughs> and I, as tempting though it may be, I'll ask everyone to hold their applause um, during public comment, please. Um, I'm going to go back up to the top of the list. And I'll say that I understand there are a number of people who will have translation services, and I think it would be equitable to uh, give an extra minute because it can take time to provide for the translation. So that would be my policy if that is your requirement. Um, but having said that, I will again 
say this name wrong, um, Marlene Amoya? Yeah. Come on up. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, I want to tell you about uh, my story and why I want to stay here. Uh, I came to the United States to have a better life uh, with more opportunities because in my country there was too much poverty. It was hard to, f to financial, uh, it was hard to financially support my family. I left in 1999. It took me a month and a half to get here. I was so sad leaving my family, but I knew that it was the best thing I could do. I have been in the United States for 19, 19 years. I had two children who are U.S. citizens. I have a good job that I feel good about it. I'm a cook and a kitchen manager and a restaurant. Uh, my kids are smart. They do good in school, even though I had to push they I have to push them sometime. <laughs> I push them because I want to to them to have a good future, follow with with the best opportunities. I have a husband who is from Mexico and we have a good relationship. I have a TPS, I got my TPS after the two thousand one earthquake. With TPS I was able to get a work permit and a driver license. I was able to pay my taxes and work legally without fear <coughs> of being deported. And every 18 months, I renew my status. I'm fighting to defend my immigration status because I want uh, because I have a family to support. I cannot take my children back to El Salvador because it's not a safe country to live in. There is a lot uh, high of violence. I want to urge you to support us and to denounce Trump's decision to eliminate TPS. I want you to fight for the legalization of the over 11 million undocumented people, and I want you to defend our right. The only thing we want is well-being of our families. We are, work, uh, we are working people, we are fighting, we are fired. Thank you very much, you. appreciate that. Um, Translate. Certainly. Uh, buenas noches a todos. Good evening to all. Uh, mi nombre es Jesús Castillo. Eh, soy de El Salvador. My name is Jesús Castillo, and I am from El Salvador. Uh, soy este padre de familia. Tengo, I, mm -hmm. tengo cuatro hijos. I am a father, and I have four children. Uh, estoy acá por hace 17 años. I have been here for 17 years. Uh, y la razón por la que estoy acá por una por darle mejor estabilidad a mis hijos, a mi familia. I am here in this country because I want to give more stability to my children and to my family. Y pues estoy acá porque pues por una preocupación porque ya este prácticamente nos cancelaron el TPS. I am here because of a great concern that I have because they have practically canceled TPS. Y la preocupación es pues ya nos van a dejar sin documentos, ya no poder manejar. I have a worry because they're going to leave us without documents. We won't be able to drive. Y, y esa es este una preocupación por yo soy el soporte de mi familia. It is a great worry to me because I am the person who supports financially my family. Eh, y, y también este quiero pedir este o a todos para que haya una Resolución. And I want to ask all of you your support to support this resolution. Para que pues nos puedan dar un un estatus permanente para poder así este ayudar a nuestras familias. I want your support um, because we need a permanent status so we can support our families. 
Y así como yo estoy acá, pues también muchas, muchas familias están pues con la misma preocupación porque ya no podemos trabajar tranquilos. The way that I am here, I also represent many families who share the same concern. We can't work <coughs> at, at peace. Y les pedimos de favor al, al consejo, todos ustedes que por favor nos ayuden. And I ask the, the entire council for your support and that you may help us. Eh, muchas gracias. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Emma Munoz. <laughs> Emma Munoz. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Emma Munoz, and I'm from El Salvador. And I, I have a TPS. And tonight, I want to share a little about my story and how um, the TPS affect me with the cancellation. Um, so in February 2001, I had the TPS. But now, with Trump um, decision to enter TPS, I had thinking what will happen to us without TPS. We now be able to work access to health insurance or my driver license. Uh, immigration officials have all our information so they can easily find us and deport us. I have a seven years old daughter um, who was born here. She goes to Bridge Street School. Uh, my daughter has an epilepsy disorder. Um, she has an, uh, in here in the United States, she's had an access to a doctor in the medicine that she need. Um, once, sorry. Uh, once TPS is canceled, they will take my driver license. Without my license, I will not be able to drive my daughter to a medical appointment. Um, Sometimes I have to take her to Boston Medical Center. Um, if we were deported, I'm worried about it because, um, oh, sorry. I will, um, without her medicine, my daughter can suffer from convulsion and she can even die. Continue my daughter's treatment is the most important thing to me. I just want to demand Trump give us a permanent resident. I have lived in this country for 18 years. Take into account all those years I have lived here and I want, and what I want to contribute to this country, we want to stay in this country to work in peace. Our family have the right to stay together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Irma. Irma. I'm also going to translate. Okay. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Irma Muñoz. Soy del Salvador. Vine a este país hace 17 años. Estoy protegida por el TPS luego de que nuestro país pasó por un terremoto. Hello, good evening. My name is Ed Irma Muñoz. I am from El Salvador. I came to this country 17 years ago. I am protected by TPS after our country, El Salvador, um, endured an earthquake. Con el, TP, con el TPS, los Estados Unidos nos, per, nos permitió trabajar legalmente, pero el 8 de enero, con la nueva legislación, dieron por cancelar TPS. Todos los que estamos protegidos, estamos preocupados que llegamos, que llegando el tiempo que nos han dado para que salgamos. With TPS, I was able to work legally in the United States, but with the January 8th decision to cancel TPS, I have a great concern. All of us who were before protected are now concerned about the time that is arriving that will be forced to leave. Estoy preocupada porque soy madre de hijos nacidos en Estados, Un en Estados Unidos. Mi país no es buen lugar para que mis hijos vivan por la alta violencia que hay. Mi hijo mayor tiene 13 años. Él está propuesto a que las maras lo recluten. I am worried as a mother because I have children who were born in the United States. My country is not a good place for my children because of the high rates of violence. I have a son who is 13 years old, and he may be forcibly recruited by gangs in El Salvador if he were to return. Yo como 
Yo como madre es preocupante que solo pensar que a mi hijo le pase algo, algo malo. Mis hijos no conocen más que su país, que es Estados Unidos. Para ellos no sería fácil acostumbrarse en otro lugar. As a mother, I am very worried to think about what could happen to my children if something bad happened. My, country, my children know no other country aside from the United States, which is their home. For them, it would not be easy to grow up <coughs> to another place. Muchos, salvador, muchos salvadoreños se vinieron obligados a venirse a este país debido, al, debido a la guerra en El Salvador. Pero esa guerra fue financiada por los Estados Unidos. Este gobierno tiene que hacerse responsable. Many Salvadorans were obligated to come to this country due to the war in El Salvador. But that war was financed by the United States. This government has to assume responsibility. Nosotros, so, nosotros solo pedimos a que nos apoyen, solo, ven, solo pedimos que nos apoyen y, so, y venimos a trabajar y no somos delincuentes, pagamos taxes. We are asking you all to support us. We only came to this country to work. We are not criminals. We pay taxes. Y de último, les, les pido al Consejo Municipal que nos apoyen para obtener una residencia permanente. And lastly, I ask the City Council to please support us to obtain a, a permanent status. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rose, Rose Bookman. Hi, um, good evening, Rose Bookbinder. Um, I work at the Pioneer Valley Worker Center and with Jobs with Justice, and my address is 6 High Street in Haydenville, but my office is here in Northampton. Um, I just wanted to thank the co-sponsors of the TPS resolution, um, and also want to second um, the no vote on the amendment for um, the civility cause clause. Um, and I just wanted to um, thank uh, the the co-sponsors for willingness to let the RTPS worker committee reflect on the resolution and um, your willingness to think about withdrawing today's resolution in order to include um, their powerful uh, uh, additions to the resolution, which we feel make it that much stronger. And it's so important that we as community members that aren't directly impacted by the decision, by these resolutions, allow for those that are impacted to have important say over it. And we also believe that um, the additions that they made um, and adding in DACA and um, undocumented language to it only strengthens it. Because just today, um, we've been working with Senator Ed Markey's office on the DREAM Act, and we got a call from his office at, um, at, at the Pioneer Valley Worker Center asking for our opinion about the King Amendment which was asking in exchange for the DREAM Act for $23 billion for the border wall and increased um, ICE uh, and DHS resources, and also asked DREAMers to, um, in order for them to gain their own status, to give up ever being able to sponsor their parents. So, I mean, how horrible is that to say once you become a citizen, once we grant you citizenship, you can never sponsor your parents. And I'm sure if they came home and spoke to their parents, their parents would say, we've done everything to sacrifice for you, so take this. But that's a false, <laughs> a false narrative, a false dichotomy to make someone choose like that. So it's so important that you include in this resolution um, you know, this, this message that we're not going to give status to one um, to hurt somebody else. And, and also to include the history of what cause, causes folks to have to immigrate here that, you know, it's U.S.-backed wars in El Salvador and places like this that have caused intense war-torn zones that people are forced to come here. And so it's our responsibility as the United States to then welcome these folks that we've forced to have to live, leave their, um, their home countries. So thank you. Thank you very much. Diana Sierra. Diana Hi, my name is Diana Sierra. I'm an organizer here at the Pioneer Valley Worker Center, and I also teach Latin American history at Smith College. Um, as a formerly undocumented person, I'm so proud to stand with my comrades, mis compañeros. I want to give them the opportunity to, to stand. They bravely come here. Si se pueden parar. They are 
amazing group of really brave immigrant workers. Um, we are a group of folks with DACA, we are a group of people with TPS um, and undocumented folks, and we are fighting one fight for our rights and dignity. It's really important, as um, Rose said, that we include all these people because with the cutting of TPS and DACA, you will be undocumented. So we really see this as one fight. Um, we really are thankful to the council for pushing forth this resolution, and we want to very, um, ex in a ha very humbly but very eagerly suggest that the resolution include lo uh, stronger language to Trump, um, not just about reconsidering his decision, but asking Trump, demanding of him that he save TPS, that he save DACA, that he create a pathway to citizenship. And as Rose mentioned, and as other folks um, mentioned in their testimonies, it's important to name the reasons why people are forced to come here. And as a historian, I think it's extremely important to name those things, that it's not just external wars, but that the United States financed those military regimes that in Central America resulted in the deaths of 300,000 people. And that we were, uh, in the case of El Salvador, financing the regime $1 million a day from 1980 to 1992, a total of $4 billion in military and economic aid. So the people who are here are descendants of people who survived horrific forms of state violence in Central America. The other thing is that I think it's really important to include very strong language to send a very clear message to ICE and to Trump. Around the country, ICE is enacting a campaign of targeting immigrant rights leaders. Um, you may have heard of the arrests that have been happening um, around the country of immigrant rights leaders, including an attack against Lucio Perez, who is an undocumented Guatemala Guatemalan man taking sanctuary in Amherst. Um, uh, ICE wrote to the Board of Immigration Appeals saying to deny his stay and to make an example out of him because he is an inspiration to other undocumented folks who may want to take sanctuary. So to conclude, I just want to thank um, the City Council um, and I also wanted to explain to the people who are here in this audience of the amazing process that our worker committee went through of coming together and proposing language to make this resolution stronger. And I also want to thank um, the comrades who fought for the anti-surveillance um, campaign. The reason that our, our immigrant leaders can stand here with you today and share their testimony is because they feel safe. Mm -hmm. They feel safe in this community. Um, and the struggle against the surveillance camera <coughs> was one of those victories that allowed them to step foot in the door. And so I also want to echo my huge concerns about the conduct amendment. I think that the conduct amendment goes against our values. Thank you. Thank you very much. This time, I, I just want to make sure other people can speak. So what I was going to say is, are there any, is there anyone else who hasn't signed up who would like to provide public comment? Yes, sir. Yep, come on up, Eric. Uh, David, uh, Mr. Phil White. Um, Eric Hark Fernandez, uh, Holyoke, Northampton District. Um, on the topic of El Salvador, I simply want to keep it brief and mention a dear friend, Jose Cruz. He was shot by his own army. He didn't want to fight for the Russians. I believe Russia is involved in the war in El Salvador. Um, and uh, he was shot through the side, so he came up and stayed with Tony and I. Uh, Mr. King wouldn't entertain Jose's dinosaur out of Philadelphia. So we had a slight disagreement, a beef, and I told him to shut up. Um, Jose was shot. He made it. Um, he married a woman, uh, Gail, from Guild Art, and built a dinosaur car for Daniel. And it was a great piece of work, and I wish I'd gotten a picture. My Pentax camera was smashed by a Vietnam vet. I took it to Gordon, Fort Gordon, for Army Training Communications. Uh, Bravo, Bravo 35569, uh, 596, that's a labor hall down the street. Uh, 35 Cav. Uh, that was Germany, actually. I later deployed to Germany in the Army. Um, after being employed in Store 24 uh, in Holyoke and Chicopee uh, with Jeanette and Arthur Swanson. So I just want to say hey to Jose. I brought him some paints up Route 66. He had a, an altercation with Gail from Guild Art, Pam, and they deported him. So I brought him some paints and they probably put him on the plane, seized him as contraband. The dinosaur cart's in the, in the area somewhere, a relic. I wish I had a photo. Alec Baldwin is, was in town that day. I didn't get a photo. And um, on a lighter note, uh, Latka, the Russian first dog in space, um, Sputnik looks like a disco ball, but <laughs> uh, apparently died of oxygen de deprivation, Latka. Um, 
And on a lighter note, I just wanted to say it seems that Donald Trump is selling deodorant today. Man. Excellent note to end on. No Thank problem. You. He's quite a salesman. We'll take the heat. And, uh, on behalf of uh, Labor Hall 596 down the road, Roth Construction out of Avon, Connecticut, RPM out of Boston, Nova Scotia, Sagan, Vegan, Doc in Holyoke, Daniel Corbett, Pete Corbett, and uh, RPM Masonry. We'll take the heat. We'll see you. Thank you, Eric. No problem. Thank you. Bill. All right. Oh, anyone else like to give public comment? I'm going to go, yes, your hand up. Come on up. Get your name and address for the record, and the floor is yours. My name is Billy Lynn Plouffe. I live at 35 Clark Street in Florence, Massachusetts. This will be very brief. I want to encourage our local government to be fearless and to exude love whenever the opportunity presents itself. Our country is in a very fearful position, but if our local governments operate with love, we are going to be able to maintain safety for everyone. We might not be able to understand every single person, but we can understand love. That's a universal language. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other question? Yes, please. My name is Marian Van Arstel of 12 Dark Hill Avenue, Florence. I am just here to speak in support of our community and of maintaining the fabric of this community. As a retired teacher and as a person who spends a lot of time now in downtown Northampton, I feel privileged to know people who are here tonight speaking in support of their right to stay. And I know them as workers, I know them as parents, their <coughs> children in our schools. One of the things we all love about Northampton is our sense of community. So I'm just here speaking tonight to thank you for what you will do, because I believe you will, to do everything we can at the local level to speak up for the values that are important to us and to protect the people we know as our neighbors and our friends. Thank you very much for those comments. Anyone else who'd like to provide public comment? Anyone else? Yes, please. Come on up. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gaza Abbasi. I'm a resident of Northampton. I'm a doctoral student in sociology at the University of Massachusetts. Um, I'm an immigrant from Pakistan. I've lived in Northampton for about um, eight or nine years. I would like to commend uh, the Council on um, endorsing this progressive DPS resolution and in providing a space um, and you know, in advocating for uh, a permanent status for people from El Salvador, um, mostly from El Salvador, who do not have, um, who do not have permanent status. I'll be quick. There's a clock. Um, so as we all know, as they have all said very eloquently themselves, they are political refugees. And as um, activists from the Worker Center have said, um, they are political refugees because of the actions of the United States government in those countries. Um, and I think that it's sometimes it's a little bit easier to sort of recognize political violence and to say, yeah, there's someone in that country like, you know, holding a gun to their head, let's make a space for them. But I think it's sometimes a little bit harder, like we need to think a little bit harder to recognize other kinds of violence that we are all, that the Americans are also extremely complicit in, and that is like economic violence. Yeah. Um, the kinds of violence that the United States has inflicted through NAFTA upon countries like Mexico and other Central American countries, it has destroyed people's livelihoods. It has resulted in starvation. It has resulted in poverty rates of over 50%. And it has actually caused massive migration to the, U to the United States. So and I, I think that it's the very least that the United States can do that like progressive, supposedly utopic bubbles that Northampton can do to like, you know, take a stand for people who have DPS and to make DPS like more permanent. Because in our mm -hmm. community, there are also migrants who have like whose families have already been torn apart by the violence that, you know, global capitalism has inflicted upon and the United States has inflicted upon their countries. Like, you know, people sort of leave their countries and never see their families again. Um, they live these very like fractured lives. Um, 
Like, if you've read Gloria Anselmo's poetry, have any of you read her poetry? Um, I would highly recommend that you do, because mm -hmm. she talks about how the borders like live inside her, like the borders fracture her. People live extremely fractured lives, and everyone, like each one of those people is a member of our community and is an equal member of our community. Um, and I think that it's really important that you, as the city council, um, you recognize that you are, you know, you're playing a democratic role here, right? You're not here to be tyrants, obviously, right? Or technocrats. <laughs> you're here to represent um, the polis, and this is the polis. And you can't, like, enact messed up resolutions or, like, threaten students or threaten activists or threaten undocumented people, um, you know, that, like, they'll be forcibly removed from these uh, spaces if they are loud. Like, and if anything, these chambers need to become more equitable and have more space, um, you know, for so that you can do your job better, so that you can hear from your constituents better. Um, and with that, I thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else like to <coughs> public comment? Okay, then we will convene and start the council meeting. And I'll ask that the roll of the council please be called. Here. Present. Here. Present. Here. Here. Um, first up is um, a rerun of, a la of last week's announcement. This is an announcement of a public hearing uh, in accordance with the Charter of Northampton, Massachusetts, Article 7, Finance and Fiscal Procedure, Section 75, <coughs> Capital <coughs> Improvement Program. Uh, by order of the City Council, a public hearing will be held on Thursday, March 1st, 2018 at 7 p.m. here in the City Council Chambers, uh, located here in the Municipal Building uh, at 212 Main Street in Northampton. The City Council will consider the Capital Improvement Program for fiscal year 2019 through 23 and hear all persons who wish to be heard uh, thereon. So that's a public hearing that will be held at our first meeting in March. We'll go now to updates from the council president and committee chairs. I'd like to share the upcoming schedule that we've put together as a council for consideration of various measures related to retail marijuana in Northampton. And I'll let the committee chairs expand on um, these notes if they wish. Uh, the Committee on Community Resources will meet on February 27th at 5 p.m. for a general community forum on this issue. The same day at 7 p.m. in the same place, um, the Committee on Legislative Matters will have public hearings on various zoning ordinances that relate to marijuana production and retail sales. The Finance Committee on March 1st <coughs> will consider an order that has to do with establishing a sales tax for retail marijuana in the city, and that is within the full city council meeting. Also on March 1st, there will be a potential first reading in the full council on that sales tax order and also the zoning ordinances that I mentioned. Um, are there other, any other updates from committee chairs? Okay. Councilor Carney. Uh, yes, in addition to those the council president mentioned, the Committee on City Services on March 5th well, on the same topic, hear from the police department and the health department on specific concerns uh, regarding enforcement and other issues related to uh, that matter. Thank you. Council Shara. Um, I'll just note, as the council president said, the community resources forum on the 27th is a very general forum. Uh, right after that, legislative matters will be um, talking about the zoning aspects of retail marijuana and then the finance committee will be talking about the financial or the the uh, lo local option sales tax um, proposal so this is a the forum at community resources is very general um, but anyone who wants to come and share their thoughts on it uh, should it's going to start with a brief presentation from the Northampton Prevention Coalition and um, and along with Spiffy and then there will also be um, a brief presentation from NETA, and then it will go into public comment. And as was noted, it needs to end uh, right at 7 because legislative matters will be, um, will be taking over from there. So uh, please come to that. And I was going to ask, do we know what day planning is taking this up? I don't know. 22nd. Okay. So Thursday the 22nd at 7 p.m. here. 
thank you. Any other announcements? Uh, I have to announce, our rules require me to announce, um, we do a regular review of executive session minutes, and I'm announcing that it's been determined that continued non-disclosure of the minutes of November 16th, 2017, our executive session is still warranted. So I say that so that it's entered into the record in accordance with the open meeting law. No other one minute announcements tonight? Oh, sorry. Oh, Council Chair, yeah. please. Something other than retail marijuana which is that before we have the retail marijuana um, forum at Community Resources, we will have our meeting, which will start at 4.30, and there will be um, a forum on the order to accept an easement at Village Hill. So that will be at 4.30 at Community Resources, um, and then at 5, we will transition to talking about retail marijuana. So come to that if that's of interest. Excellent. Thank you. If there's no other one-minute announcements, I'll ask the mayor if he has any communications this evening. None? Okay. Um, we'll do the consent agenda, which contains approval of the minutes of January 18th, 2018 and February 1st, 2018, the appointment to various boards and committees, which have been uh, reviewed by city, the Committee on City Services with positive recommendations uh, as follows. Dennis Helmus, um, well, actually, Council Carney, I'll, I'll if I may, can I ask you to go through them since uh, I'm certainly. the actual committees? Yes, these were all uh, forwarded back to the full council with positive recommendation. For the Council on Aging, we approved Dennis Helmus of 176 North Street uh, in the term January 2018 to 21, filling the expired term of Michael Ahern. For the Conservation Commission, we recommended uh, Elizabeth Rublinka. 406 North Farms Road for a term January 2018 to June 2021, replacing the term of Tim Parshall. In the Energy, Energy and Sustainability Commission, we sent uh, Benjamin Weil and Ashley Muspratt, Benjamin of, Benjamin of 123 Audubon Road, term uh, January 2018 to June 2021, replacing the term of Aidan Maynard, and Ashley Muspratt of four for Fort Hill Terrace for a term January 2018 to 21, replacing the term of Christina Hodges. And finally, for the Public Shade Tree Commission, we sent the name of uh, Jay Gerard, 158 Ryan Road, term uh, July of 2017 to June of 2020, and that was a reappointment. And again, all those came with a positive recommendation. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Carney. Are there any removals from the consent agenda? If not, is there a motion to approve it? So moved. Move to approve. Made by Council White, seconded by Council Barge. No discussion. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The agenda is passed uh, unanimously. We're now up to 18.031, a resolution calling for DHS to extend temporary protected status, or TPS, for all nationals who cannot safely return to their home countries. This is the second reading. Uh, is there any objection to waiving the reading, since it was read at the last meeting? Uh, without objection, I will do that. Is there a motion to approve this in second reading? So moved. Second. Um, is there any discussion? Yes. Nash, so, um, so, so first of all, I, I have to thank everybody who showed up tonight to provide testimony. Um, it was very moving. I, um, I applaud your courage, and I. Um, uh, I, I, I think of you as neighbors, and I will live in that um, person. So um, that, um, as, as you can see, our, this process started by an email from uh, somebody, Jonathan Goldman, with the state committee to, for three of us to take this up, has kind of evolved into something much more profound, and that, um, and through that process of, of, of working uh, with uh, the Pioneer Valley uh, workers, um, that, um, that new information is being provided for our, our resolution to, um, to clearly enhance it. And um, so what we would like to do tonight is to ask that, um, that we send this re resolution to committee and uh, to community resources in particular, um, where the additions can be considered 
and um, and we uh, suspect that they will be um, uh, 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 in strongly included by that committee and we can then bring this back here hopefully uh, we, we the, the time frame is a little funny because we have so much pressure on all of our committees right now with the marijuana resolutions but um, anyway the, the time frame aside we would like it to go to committee have the improvements and then come back here for second reading got it thank you councilor barge and um, when I had talked with Jim this morning going over this resolution, um, not knowing at that time that the group itself was also designing a resolution, I don't have a problem with this. I think it's great that we're coming together and working together. And I agree with sending this to community resources so that we all can work together on your resolution and ours and pull in the strong words that are going to tell Trump what we are saying, what everybody deserves. Thank you. Any, other, any other comments? You know, I, I'll tell you the reason why I ask to hold applause. It's just because it helps me move along through the agenda. So I hope you just consider that request uh, from me because it helps me facilitate council business. That's the reason I ask. Um, any other discussion in the council? So it sounds like a good idea. The committee is a forum where the advocates can work directly with councilors to improve the language and enhance it in some of the ways that, that we've heard. So I think it's a great idea. Councilor so, uh, Point of information. <clears throat> uh, given the, the scheduling constraints, particularly uh, community resources has a very uh, defined time within to within where it has to incorporate all the uh, comments and discussion the broad comments and discussions about uh, legal marijuana retail in, the, in Northampton I <clears throat> I would imagine then that this would probably not be on that agenda and probably wouldn't show up until March the 19th. next agenda March 19th mm -hmm. wow. so I, I think the public should be apprised of the fact that it will not likely come back to this floor until April I think the first meeting in April um, with that notification it does not diminish um, our our commitment to, to seeing this through and at the same time actually I, I, I will echo what the other counselor said it's considerably enhanced and reinforced it's a it's a stronger document that will come forward and hopefully um, I, I think we'll speak rather clearly and more concisely about what it is that we um, stand for here so I, I hope that it I mean in if if there is a certain urgency that actually a timeline urgency then maybe we can actually consider a special meeting should it come to that council the barge and council share right so because of the schedule on community resources, what about legislative matters? You must be really filled up also. And community resources is, I mean, as you heard, we had two. We right, had but I'm asking about legislative. That's, that's. Oh. that's <laughs> uh, legislative matters comes, we'll be having a meeting the same night or the reason that there's a deadline. Ours will be at seven o'clock and um, this, resolution will not be coming before legislative matters in that context. I don't think it's necessary. Um, and so the hope is that it, it, we'll be talking about marijuana and three other zonings and I know. Uh, taxi laws. So, uh, yeah. Councilor Sharon. Um, I, uh, we're happy to have it come to community resources. Um, we can, after this meeting, we can try and get together and see if we can find time for a special meeting for it before the 19th of March. Um, we had tried to find time for the forum that we're having on the 27th, so I know that it's already been a challenge to find time for a special meeting, but um, we can work on seeing if we can find time before the 19th if there is a time constraint. All right, Councilor Klein. I would just pose the question if there's the possibility of withdrawing the uh, withdrawing this and having the actual sponsors work with the Pioneer Valley Workers Center to kind of get it to where you'd like it to be and to bring it back to the full council the next full council meeting just wondering you, if 
directing a question to anyone in particular? Um, I guess <laughs> in terms of logistics and rules, can we do something like that? Because it also makes sense to me that the people who originally sponsored this would be working with the people in the community who um, wanted altered. To, to answer your question as best I can, to me, I think the improvements would be germane to the original uh, resolution. They'd be on the same topic. They would just be enhancing and expanding it. Um, so to me, withdrawing it versus amending it mm -hmm. are equivalent. And if we amended it, it might actually be a quicker process since we've already had a first reading on the substance of the resolution. So that was, that's why I would favor getting it in committee. And even if the amendments were substantial, mm -hmm. uh, I think those would be in order if we were to amend them onto the original. So just to respond to that, if the concern is that it would need to go to two meetings, we'd have to do two votes if we withdrew it and then submitted it was submitted again. Mm -hmm. We could always do two readings in in one night. So I don't think that necessarily would slow it down. I guess I mean, my I think please, either sorry. one is really okay, but okay. it just seems to me that it would actually be more um, appropriate for the sponsors to be working on it, and mm -hmm. it could go more quickly, I think, than if it went out to committee. I'll, I'll tell you procedurally, <laughs> procedurally, I don't like it when things are just withdrawn summarily. I want to have a vote on exactly. it. Exactly. And I guess I feel, I, I, I personally am more comfortable putting into a committee if it works for the advocates and counselors for discussion and revision than voting to table something like this indefinitely, especially because, I don't know, you can read it in the newspaper that's been tabled indefinitely and you may get the wrong message. So I, personally, I think it's cleaner and, and quicker, not quicker, but simpler to do it in, in the committee. If you have strong objections, then that'd be different. But let's see. So we had Councillor Dwight and then Councillor Labarge. So we had discussed all the variable opportunities in which to approach this. And, and, and in this, to uh, the Council President's comments, this is cleaner. And in point of fact, actually, the document as it's drafted now is there, there actually is that has not been introduced yet, but the amended version is uh, it's substantially improved, mm -hmm. and um, but does not. Whereas the original one was more general, um, this one is more granular and and personal, and as such, I think the. Um, as we've said often before, the power of resolutions comes more from the uh, community response it generates. And my concern is that uh, someone sees that this is withdrawn. It may imply there's some negative reason for withdrawing. When point of fact, there's a very positive reason. So proceeding this way, as you said, the result's ultimately the same. And, and as such, the, the message is still clear that the idea is to amplify and improve this. Um, the original intent is good, uh, earnest, but not um, not as meticulous. Before we proceed with other comments, is there uh, any desire to actually have a motion to refer this to the committee? So we um, I would like to move that we refer to uh, the Community Resources Committee to, for the purposes of uh, expanding its its value. I second that. Okay. So, to the to the referral of this to the committee, are, is there any further discussion? Councilor Bidwell. Just, just another procedural question. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the various permutations uh, have been explored by the, by the councilors, but I just wonder in, if in deference to, the, to what we've heard tonight and the, and the showing of support, would it make any sense to go ahead and approve this and do a second supplemental resolution that, that reinforces but adds the granularity? Uh, that wouldn't be as neat and clean, but it would it would it would it would it would allow the process that's underway to come to a certain closure point here tonight, uh, in recognition of everything we've heard, and then do a do a second one. I don't want to foul up the works, but I just wonder if that's a possibility. Well, th that is a possibility. However, the um, the original resolution is actually embedded in the fabric of this, so it would be it would be repetitive, okay. and and consequently, I, I mean, I think I think the sponsors are in agreement that we would like to see the clearer, more amplified version be the one that be the final one that we vote on. Okay. Just question. Yep. Good, good discussion for sure. Any other comments on the question of referral? Um, if not, we will vote. All those in favor of the referral, please say aye. 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 Votes no. Uh, so that matter is referred.
And so the work is going to continue a committee, and the sponsors, I think, will follow up with advocates who are interested in that issue. So thank you. And now we're going to recess for, since there are no presentations, we're going to recess for the Committee on Finance that will be chaired by its Vice Chair, Councillor Carney. Thank you. Uh, would the administrative assistant call the roll, please? Um, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Shera. Yes. Uh, first, we have, could I have a motion to approve the minutes of February 1st? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. And then we have four financial orders tonight. The first is um, under the recommendation of Mayor Nakowitz and the Planning and Sustainability. Uh, item 18.039, an order to authorize acceptance of Valley Bike Share easements. Ordered that, whereas Walk Bike Northampton, the Pedestrian and Bicycle Comprehensive Plan 2017, recommends the creation of a bike share program. And whereas in spring 2017, City Council authorized the mayor to accept an easement for a Valley Bike Share and Station in Florence, and whereas other bike share easements and licenses are needed, ordered that the mayor is authorized to accept easements and fee or other interests in land for valley bike share stations with such terms as the mayor determines are agreeable. Uh, is there a motion in finance? Make a motion. Second. Okay. Seconded and we'll from the mayor, please. Um, again, it's sort of a follow on to the previous, uh, previous order we brought before you. Um, Mr. Fide has been working as part of the uh, multi community um, Valley Bike Share program to identify additional spaces for the stations. And so we just need to be able to um, work through this process of, of getting the easements that we need to install the pads for the actual installation of the stations. Mr. Fiden's here if you have any specific questions about it, but it's uh, fairly straightforward, I think. Are there any other questions from counselors? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I had a question. Um, we. Um, <coughs> Orders to accept easements and other interest in property come to the council all the time. Usually, I'm, I'm accustomed to seeing them with regard to a specific mm -hmm. uh, piece of property as opposed to a more generic one like this. Is there some reason other than just speedily moving along the process why we're doing them as a group instead of uh, you know, one by one, which would be more the custom as I understand? Yeah, I think, well, I'm going to have uh, Wayne come up because we're, we're talking about how big are the pads that we're working on 40 feet by 8 feet yeah so um, and there is some issues about the exact locations we're still determining some of them so I don't know if you want to give them a rundown of where the locations are that we're sure yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the short answer to your question is it's sort of in flux and it's probably going to remain in flux so it gives us more flexibility they're all relatively small so there's there are 14 stations um, and we're and most of them are on public property um, but there's a few that are on private property. And again, we're, we're still working those through, so we're looking at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, for example. They may or may not agree to give us an easement, but we'd rather put it on their side of the line than prior to the tree belt. So we, we could do all these things within the tree belts in town, but it would just mean a lot of compromise for the stations, some effect on snow plowing operations, um, some places where there's no butter who's willing to do it. We prefer to do that. So the ones we're looking at right now are um, Cooley Dickinson Hospital. Again, these may or may not work out. The YMCA, um, Lilly Library, which, um, you know, which technically is private. Um, no, Florence Bank we've moved. So that's going to be the street. Um, and then we so we studied fairly exactly where the city boundary is. So the few other places where it might fit within our boundary, it might go over at, at the boundary. So. I guess we felt like we could do it as a group because they're relatively small and not, you know, the policy thing is we're willing to accept these. Um, the mayor, you, you all know, the mayor can't accept licenses without going before city council, but we're pouring concrete pads, and so there's a significant cost. And a license means someone could kick us out at any point. So we'd like to have some assurance that mm -hmm. if we spend money in a li on a pad, we don't have to rip it out later. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Anyone else are prepared to vote in finance? And that was for a positive recommendation? Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, anything, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that carries. And the next item is 
Order 18.040 upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz in Planning and Sustainability to declare Lot 4, Village Hill South, surplus. Ordered that, whereas on September 17, 7th, 2018, City Council authorized the City to accept a deed for Lot 4, Earl Street, Village Hill South, at the former Northampton State Hospital for future public uses or economic development. And whereas the City acquired the property on October 10th, 2017, and whereas the City is exploring opportunities to sell the property to promote economic development, ordered that Lot 4 is declared surplus to City needs. Further, the Mayor is authorized to sell the parcel in such conditions as he seems reasonable, as he deems reasonable. Um, I guess I'll ask if there are questions first from folks before. Any questions for the Mayor on this? Mayor, how big is the lot? Um, this is the parcel that's sort of at the intersection, at the corner of Earl Street and uh, Grove Street, and the exact acreage wing is just under half an acre. Under half an acre. Um, there's no actual access to it, um, and it was something that Mass Development didn't want, um, and so we agreed to take it, um, and we now have uh, an interested um, party that's interested in purchasing it. Um, and so, again, the city will sell it, it'll go for economic development, and we'll reap a small amount of funding from it. So that's why we're asking for the surplus order. Okay, we don't have that, but folks should have <coughs> in their package the map that shows the lot four on Earl Street. Yes, question. Um, the, the, the print on the map was pretty, I could, mm -hmm. pretty small. Could, could you just orient us as to wh wh what are the abutting properties here? I can't um, quite picture this. The nearest this. one would be um, VCA woodworking. So it is right next to VCA? Yes. Okay. Um, and then um, up, heading up Grove Street, the nearest one would be the Grove Street shelter. Okay, so it's between. Okay. So it's between those okay. two. Um, and it's a parcel that really mass development right. chose not to develop because of the size and because of the lack of the grade and the lack of access. Right. So, um, <coughs> so um, it really has limited value except for a few parties. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Is there a motion in finance Make on this? Okay. Moved and seconded for a positive. Positive. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That carries. And the next item upon the recommendation of Mayor Narkowitz and Planning and Sustainability. Item 18.041, an order related to eligible traffic mitigation expenses. Ordered that, whereas zoning requires that certain development projects make transportation improvements or voluntarily make a payment in lieu of such improvements to mitigate traffic impacts that are reasonable related to the development. And whereas said funds may only be used for transportation mitigation reasonably related to development and in accordance with any conditions imposed by the Planning Board in approving the development project. And whereas the City has established a traffic mitigation account administered, administered by the Office of Planning and Sustainability to accept said payment in lieu of transportation improvements, donations, and payments. And whereas City Council has previously, in September 2012 and October 2012, authorize the city to use these funds for any eligible design, feasibility, planning, and for certain construction projects, including bicycle lanes, multi-use trails, park and ride lots, and other projects, ordered that city council authorizes the mayor to also use these funds for the following, to the extent funds are available, and the projects mit mitigate impacts reasonably related to the development project that provided the funds. They are bicycle share pads and stations, other multi-use trail access ramps, complete street projects, and traffic calming projects. And I'll ask the mayor if there's any questions. Actually, going to ask Mr. Biden to speak to this one. Um, just he can give you a little more detail. But obviously, it's a we're asking you to take an additional vote in addition to the ones you took in 2012. But I'll have him explain. So this does have more flexibility. We collect a fair amount of money um, for traffic mitigation projects. It has to be used very narrowly. So we collected $100,000, for example, from the food co-op, 
which is paying for the design of an intersection near them. Um, and we collect everything from, you know, $1,000 to some very small projects up to $100,000 the biggest projects. The funds are almost always sort of very specifically designated. We, when a project goes to the planning board, we usually know how those funds are going to be used. Um, and so this lets us move forward. The, the immediate timing for this is the very w top one on the list is the bike share station pads. We're paying for some of the pads out of this fund, um, but generally lets us go forward. We've tried to match these funds for other grants. So Pleasant Street, for example, you know, we just spent $2.9 million in Pleasant Street for storm sewer and for complete streets. That all started with $90,000 that came from NETA for their traffic mitigation. So that's sort of a good example. That, that $90,000 leverage, in essence, you know, another million dollars of funds. Um, and so this gives us that flexibility to move forward on these projects. Any other questions? Councilors? Uh, who is that? Oh. Is there somebody? Oh. Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't see the hand here. Please. So traffic mitigation funds are usually attached to a particular project, right? They always come out of a project and they're usually attached to a project nearby, correct? So is the suggestion that the money for um, the new things, the share pads and the stations and things like that would be in the areas where the mitigation funds are attached to, as it were? That's correct. So just an example, we collect $5,000 a year from Village Hill Owners Associates, mm -hmm. Associations as traffic mitigation. It's sort of a unique arrangement with Village Hill. We want to use, um, the pads are about $10,000 each. We want to use $10,000 from that fund for one pad that will go there. And things we want to use money from one pad that will go there. The grant we got for bike share included enough money for two pads. So we're sort of piecing this together from different sources. So they're not so. From what the 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 locations you just cited, it sounds like they're not necessarily attached to, directly to the project, the development that is um, giving the mitigation funds. One of the willies. It's a very tight nexus. Did you just say King Street and then Village Hill, though. Uh, I'm sorry. Two different examples. So, okay. uh, so Village Hill is paying for a pad of Village Hill. The money we collected from Walgreens would pay for a pad okay. in that area. Now, we have to show a nexus. It's not necessarily immediately next door, but sort of that we can show that some people bicycling to, to Walgreens would benefit from a bike share station that's nearby. So that one would probably be the one on State Street, at the end of State Street Stop and Shop, which is close to Walgreens. So not on the property, but, you know, within 500 feet or 600 feet or something. Um, Director Fine, so do other communities use these criteria? Yes. So there's sort of two, three different approaches that are out there for traffic mitigation. Some communities have gone to the state legislature and had specific grants. They've allowed to charge basically an impact fee as a home rule piece. And so those communities, you know, have a lot more flexibility in how those, they use their money. Um, <laughs> some communities um, like us sort of say, you know, we have to mitigate the exact you know, a project that's coming forward. The way we've avoided going to the state legislature um, is it's technically a voluntary fee. Now, it's not voluntary to do mitigation, but, you know, Walgreens could have paid for a traffic signal in front of Walgreens, for example. And they chose to do, to give us money and let us make improvements instead. Um, so you sort of get that, that model. And then some communities, I think, don't have a strong legal basis. And I'm not commenting on those okay. communities. <laughs> Yes, um, the complete streets item, that seems like a fairly expansive set of things that could fall under complete streets. Is that grant driven as well? Like if we get a complete streets grant for a purpose or is it driven by the definition of complete streets within our code of ordinances? Turning radiuses, sidewalks, and like it's a large list of things that are under the rubric of complete streets. So it could be both. You know, certainly on Pleasant Street, we leverage it with a state grant. Um, we've been looking at doing, again, using the Walgreens money, doing a, a bike path on ramp at Edwards Square. Now, that was, that you all approved in 2012, so that's not an example before you, but that, you know, provides improved access to Walgreens. Um, you can justify that as part of the process. Again, that, that we already have authority for, but, so some of the things are things that, what we're trying to avoid, I think the reason we're using the language is we're not using these funds just for repaving roads or for making routine improvements that doesn't really sort of change the patterns. We're looking at things that actually make 
but generally make walking and bicycling more attractive and therefore reduce the traffic mm -hmm. that's out there. Great. Thank you very much. Two more, uh, Councillor, and then Councillor. Yeah. I'm just curious, what's, what's the order of magnitude of the dollars that sit in this, in this fund at any given? I'm sure it, yeah. it varies a lot. Down, but we average, for a while we were averaging about $100,000 a year of new funds, although that's dropped as both we had less commercial development um, and as people have made more of their own improvements. Our, our first choice is always for people to make their own improvements. We don't have to go to bid. And so we've seen a lot of that. The Montessori School, for example, put sidewalk extensions and put a, a, a rapid flashing beacon at Montessori School, which we would rather they do it. So we're getting less money, but we're not getting less traffic impacts. Um, so it's about $100,000 a year. Um, I didn't check the balance before I came here. My guess, and it's really just a guess, it's a neighbor of about $250,000 we have. A lot of it's called for. You know, we have a contract for the roundabout design at, at um, North King Street. Um, but that's about what we have. Most of it has a project that's earmarked for doing it. Uh, so most of these bulleted items, with the exception of uh, complete streets projects, I already assumed were already covered under what we had already authorized in that in and comes under the auspices of, of, of mitigation. I mean, the, the um, multi-use trail access ramps, I know that we've actually done that before, right? And uh, uh, traffic calming projects, of course, that's, that's almost in the definition of the, uh, the offset. So why, why are we making these, why are we creating this specificity when it may already be, in fact, covered? So you will approve unlimited use of the funds for feasibility, planning, and design, which is primarily what we try to do because that leverages other grant monies. We came before you in 2012, and one of the councillors who's not here already wanted a specific list of projects. So in 2012, you approved a long list of projects, but not a sort of more open list. Okay. List. No, I, I, I'm just flashing back to uh, I think it was a mitigation fees paid by Walmart at one point, and that, and those were basically discretionary funds that we could apply towards mitigating the traffic issue that is now being right. uh, dealt with. There was also, and I don't know who's right or who's wrong, but there was a previous interpretation from a past city solicitor that we could spend funds. The, the Wall uh, Mart's a good example without going to council and. My understanding now is that's not that's correct. Not okay, that's, so that's the that's the answer. Oh, thank you very much. That was true from you know from whenever we did that until 2012, we did those sort of with that specific authority. Then. Got it. Thank you. Um, is Village Hill the only recurring annual agreement that we have? Otherwise, these are one-time payments. Yes, Village Hill. Well, no, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Smith College does as well. So Smith College gives us, so Village Hill is a flat $5,000, 25 for the southern campus, 25 for the northern campus, and it never goes up in inflation. Smith College for Ford Hall gives us $5,000 a year, except there's an inflation factor, so it's up to about $7,500 now. Um, those are the only two projects. So these, this came out partially out of planning board conditions and zoning, but also partially out of the MEPA process, the state environmental process. And those are the only two development projects we've had in all the time I've been here where the private development was big enough to kick in the MEPA process. Um, we had lots of, you know, public roads go through this all the time, lots of projects, landfill went through it. But, you know, Village Hill was sort of a massive project and Ford Hall was massive. So that's why they're a little bit different than the other projects. Any other questions? Councillor? So the, the mitigation projects that I know are in Leeds, and I know that we did a pretty comprehensive public process to kind of get a sense of what the community wanted um, prioritized for mitigation. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering if that happens with all the mitigation projects, and if so, if people will be made aware of the fact that the, the new pieces are options, and if in fact, um, you know, if they decide that's not an option they're interested in, would uh, the planning department go forward with putting in things like um, the bike pads and, and things like that if the community members who live in that location don't feel? Right. So we've done some of both. In, in places that are dense residential neighborhoods, we've done outreach. 
On King Street, which is more commercial, we've tended to work with the merchants there because it's not a residential neighborhood that's out there. The the smaller projects, though, we've tended to do without that sort of outreach. So the bicycle pads, the design of uh, you know some small improvements. <coughs> tend to do that. So yes, the, for the big ticket items, we would still do it in a residential neighborhood. We would still continue to do the outreach and let that choose the price. So the bike pads might go down without kind of a community process or a separate process for the bike pads. So we you know we've sent we've used every list serve we're aware of when we were locating them to do an outreach, including for example the Village Hill list to say, you know, we're thinking of this, we're open to any sort of comments that are out there. So it was a different kind of process, but it was certainly trying to do as targeted outreach for where those those things were located. Thank you. Are there any questions for okay. Is there a motion in finance? Make a motion. Second. Foster mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That one carries unanimous. I still want to vote. And I still want to vote. have Upon the recommendation of the mayor, item 18.042, in order to declare cell tower site 170 Glendale Road surplus, ordered that whereas the city entered into a 20-year lease for 6,000 square feet of land located at 170 Glendale Road for use as a cell tower site in 2000, and whereas the site currently contains a 199-foot monopole tower which is owned and operated by American Tower LP, and the tower supports the equipment of four telecommunications companies, municipal antennas, and associate equipment shelters. And whereas the existing 20-year lease of the site to American Tower LP expires on May 16, 2020, and whereas the contained lease of the property for the purpose of a cell power site is valuable to the city, as it provides an average of $115,000 in annual revenue to support city solid waste services, and also provides a location for municipal antennas for public safety. And whereas Mass General Law Chapter 30B, subsection 16, requires a vote of the city council to surplus any interest in public property prior to its disposal, now therefore be it resolved the property at a 170 Glendale Road, currently being used as a cell tower site, be declared surplus as of May 16, 2020, and available for lease for a period of up to 30 years, and the City Council authorizes and directs the Mayor to award and execute said lease on such terms and conditions as the Mayor deems reasonable. Uh, ask the Mayor to explain. Yeah, so, um, uh, you're probably wondering why we're coming to you two years early, um, but uh, these are fairly complicated um, lease arrangements, and we want to do a very uh, diligent and detailed RFP process. Um, we also have to consider that um, if American Tower does not win the new lease, they will need time to deconstruct the tower that is there and a new potential lease lessee would have to erect a new tower. So we're trying to allow ourselves a couple of, a, a, a good amount of time uh, to do this process. Um, you'll also note that the municipal, you know, one of the municipal modernization acts changed the ability, uh, previously 20 years was the longest period you could lease, now you can do 30 year leases. That's why we're asking for the surplusing to be for 30 years. So um, we're gonna begin the process of, uh, you know, putting together an RFP and going out to bid, but we need the surplusing of this uh, of this site for an additional 30 years to allow us to, to go through the lease process. Okay, question? Yeah, I remember um, going to the mayor and talking with the mayor about placing this tower on Glendale Road in the landfill. And I also had a private business on my ward who actually wanted the tower placed on their gravel pit. And I had to tell them that's not my job as a city councilor to make money for a private business. And working with the mayor and with Wayne Fiden at that time was the selection of the landfill. And at 115000 a year, that's money. And to me, I'm kind of glad to see we're going from 20 to 30 years on this. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, that was um, probably another mayor, Mayor Higgins or Mayor Ford. Um, but no, I, I think it's uh, it's a it, it provides uh, an income stream. Um, and again, as it says in the resolution, we also have some of our public safety equipment on that tower as well, our our police and fire radios and DBW radios. So it serves a dual purpose for the city as well uh, to make sure that we have radio coverage in that part of the city. Um, and that's part of the agreement. The lease agreement is that they allow us to put those uh, facilities on the tower. Um, and uh, there's also a, a backup generator that's part of it as well. So um, it, it, and again, the revenue stream, particularly um, for the uh, for the solid waste enterprise fund, it's it's been important. So, Thank you. yep. Uh, what's going on? Um, is there a, if the current tower needs to be deconstructed and a new one put up? Is there a plan for the public safety antennas that are currently on there? Yeah, we, I mean the the RFP will again stipulate that we would um, that we would want our you know we would want space on the tower so there'd have to be a transition plan worked out so that if in fact a new tower I mean you know um, probably in all likelihood the folks who have already invested the money in the tower are going to probably have an advantage over other bidders I don't know how this will work the technology's changed I don't know but um, but yeah we would definitely stipulate that our equipment would have to be would have to be allowed on any new tower that was constructed so we'd have to figure out some kind of a transition plan yeah I guess my question was more what happens in the interim exactly and that would we'd probably stipulate some kind of a transition plan um, whether a new tower was built near it um, and, and we transitioned over that way I'm not sure so um, it's above my uh, expertise but uh, we would certainly not you know allow our equipment to go silent for that period of time Councilor Bigwell uh, I had a question too about the length length of the lease to, to lock in a, a revenue stream of well now hundred fifteen thousand dollars a year whatever it might be for 30 years is great but do we do we I, I just wonder about locking in something for that long a period of time in a period of such dramatic technological change mm -hmm. might we find ourselves 20 years from now realizing from the city's point of view there is a better use of that parcel and a more uh, a better use with a more robust economic return based on technology then it's sort of the flip side of locking something in for such a long period of time yeah and we're if you'll note it says for a lease up up to a period of 30 years it doesn't require it to be 30 years but we just wanted to have maximum flexibility and we're definitely technology has changed since we did this last lease and um, there's different ways that these leases are structured. Um, sometimes they're a straight, you know, rental revenue. Sometimes there's uh, this sort of variable rate depending on uh, on the number of carriers that want to be on there. And so we are we are consulting um, people who do this, and we are looking at other leases that communities. But I'm definitely mindful of the fact that you know who knows whether we'll be communicating this way right. in 20 in 10 years right. Um, right. so we, we definitely will try to protect the city's interest um, and I will tell you a lot of companies a lot of cell companies are trying to get people to sell their towers um, and they've been offering cities money and offer you know they've offered us money to buy it because I think they understand the value the potential value technology is getting smaller um, you can potentially put more equipment on the tower so a lot of them are actually trying to get uh, people to mm -hmm. sell the towers. Mm -hmm. We're not really interested in selling city property. Right. Um, so definitely that's a good point, and we are going to be very mindful of that. Um, and if it's not advantageous to do a longer lease, we may do a shorter lease. Yeah. Or have out clauses. Councilor Dwight? Um, it was my understanding that it, when we first established the rules and criteria relative to um, communication poles or towers like this, that we actually were... I'm not sure if we were encouraging or if we actually stipulated that they, anyone running and operating a tower in the city within the city limits, uh, was required to make that tower available to even to competitors' uh, competing systems, so that to, to try and reduce the the at the time the discussion was of course a great concern that that we'd all be bristling with towers, uh, competing tower systems, and the idea was is to consolidate um, is many transmitters as you could possibly put on a tower including municipal services 
but it, it, am I delusional? I thought, and that, and I think this is ancient history. This is, and we're talking in the context of this technology, of course, ancient history. Probably it was probably about 15 years ago. Yeah. But do, do are you aware of any such um, conditions or standards? I'll have to go back and look at the existing lease. I mean, this is a company that basically builds towers and leases to right, different right. communities, and that's their, that's their business plan. I don't think their, their plan is to exclude anybody. Um, so I, I, I don't know how many different, um, you know, uh, antennas or, or we have on, on each of these towers, but I can I can certainly find that yeah. out. Wayne, do you have, do you, yeah. am I delusional? Did I make this up? or? No, you're, you're right. It, um, it's, it, it's a zoning requirement. We basically say you can't build a new tower until you've looked at all the existing towers and you have to do a, a radio frequency analysis. So the mayor's right. We leave it to the private sector to make the numbers work. But our experience, and this has been true around the country, is if I have to go you, to you to negotiate for your tower, you're willing to rent me space. You may not rent me the top of the tower, but right. the zoning makes you need space. Right. Okay. Yeah, correct. All right. Just so we don't have towers next to each other competing. Right. That was the that was the concern. So, yeah. I'm glad you had the uh, the Oracle of history. Here, uh, <laughs> yeah. to oh, yeah. We were both there. And we do have a you know, and we do have there there are dead spots in the city where yeah. people are actively seeking towers, um, and we have a suitor for another location in the city, and they're looking for another tower location. For those of you who. Um, have Verizon and happen to drive through Florence, and uh, you know it's, there's some serious dead zones there. So I know they're looking for something. So anyway, but they would have to go through that zoning requirement. Any other questions? Okay. Is there a motion in finance? Make a motion. Positive. Moved for a positive recommendation second. and second. All those in favor? Aye. Say aye. Aye. And that carries. And. No other business before us, so I'll ask if there's a final motion. Make Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Hey, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So we're back to the full City Council, and we have a series of financial orders. Uh, the first is 18.018. In order to appropriate $20,000 in Whiting Street Trust Funds, the second reading, is a motion to approve this? So moved. Uh, any discussion? on that motion made by Councilor White and seconded by Councilor Barge. If not, could we have a roll call? Uh, Councilor Goodwill. Stepped out. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Yes. Uh, so there are six affirmative votes for that financial order, so notwithstanding her absences, uh, it passes. Correct? Correct. Good. Excuse me, no, there are seven, in fact. Yep, seven. Good. Uh, now, 18.019, in order to rescind borrowing authority for four votes. Second. Okay. Any discussion on this? Uh, let's have a roll call, please. Um, Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Barge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Okay. Um, seven affirmative with two no votes. Or no, not voting votes. Absences. Um, 18.020, in order to reprogram money for the Academy of Music stage doors for foundation repairs. The second. Second. Made by Councilor Barge, seconded by Councilor Klein. Any discussion on this order? Not could we have a roll call, please? Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Barge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. 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 That's approved. Now we have a series of first readings. Uh, the first is 18.039 in order to authorize acceptance of Valley Bike share easements. Second. Any discussion on this order? If not, could we have a roll call, please? Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Yes. 18.040, in order to declare lot four in Village Hill South surplus. There's a motion on this. Move to approve. 
Second. Okay. Made by Council Bill. Seconded by Council Sher. Any discussion on this order? If not, a roll call, please. Um, Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. 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 Passes eighteen point zero four one. An order related to eligible traffic mitigation expenses. Is there a second. 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 Um, made by Councillor Labard. Second by Councillor Bidwell. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Mm -hmm. Councillor Murphy. Present. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. And Councillor Labar. Yes. Okay. Passed unanimously. Now 18.042 in order to declare a cell tower site at 170 Glendale Road surplus. Is there a second? Who seconded? Okay. okay. Councillor Labarge made the motion, seconded by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion? Can we roll call, please? Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Murphy is not present. And that passes unanimously. Um, there are some procedural, interesting procedural issues to discuss <clears throat> about the next orders. Um, for that purpose, I wonder if there's any objection to taking 18.016 in order to amend council rules first, because I believe it is simpler and it could illustrate the process we'll use for the other rules order. There's no objection. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the original order, uh, unamended order, that I submitted. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, the Committee on Legislative Matters considered this rules change and effectively endorsed an amended version of it. Um, I would like to suggest that I describe the amendments and then it would be in order to have a motion to amend the one that is on the floor with the amendments. Um, so let, let me do that. Okay. This is, you'll recall something that I suggested to remove the, from our rules, the, the Committee on Public Works and Utilities. Um, for reasons I explained last time, it was a committee that didn't meet as often as we would like it to meet, and we wanted to take its responsibilities and kind of redistribute them throughout the other committees. But I heard from other counselors some concerns about overloading certain committees with that redistribution, so I proposed a slightly different way to do it, and you can see the textual amendments in your packet, but the, the salient features are, rather than holding public hearings on water, sewer, and stormwater within the Committee on City Services, I propose doing it within the Committee on Finance. And secondly, I sort of restate <coughs> the um, basic jurisdiction of the Committee on City Services. All these jurisdictions were sort of enumerations of a bunch of different things or departments in a way that was cumbersome, but also suggested that these committees had to cycle through interviews of every department in a way that um, was a little concerning. So the jurisdiction of city services would now read simply matters related to the activities and operation of municipal government, which about covers it. Um, public works issues could still fall under that but it removes the kind of the, the pressure of, you know, listing public safety, public health, veterans affairs, social services, libraries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a simpler way to do it. Um, finally, a, some other technical changes since, we, since I cracked this open, which I had not intended, but having cracked it open, um, there's kind of a vestigial element to each committee that had so-called related departments, boards, and agencies which I think every councillor knows who served on these committees, it's, that's, those are no longer necessary to have written in uh, these rules. Um, it's clear from a, the two uh, provisions at the very bottom on page two that committees 
not only have the power to hold hearings on any matter within their jurisdiction, but they can develop review and recommend policies on any matter within their jurisdiction. And finally, a small tweak, um, it would say, a majority of those appointed and serving on a committee shall constitute a quorum. What's up with that? Well, when, I remember when Councilor Adams uh, resigned from the City Council, we suddenly had, I think, three committees that had four seats, but there were only three people serving on them. So it was always bizarre to me that a quorum, you count the quorum based on the number of seats. That's the default. So suddenly the quorum, uh, the quorum of those four-person committees was still three, but there were really only three people on the committee. So the, in reality, the quorum was two, not three. And so if we change it to a quorum is, I think logically, a majority of people who are actually serving on the committee, we avoid problems like being, it being difficult to get a quorum together to actually convene. And there are some open meeting law issues that are resolved by doing it this way. And I spoke with the solicitor about it this afternoon, and he's certainly fine um, with that change. So that's the explanation on that. And those amendments received a positive recommendation effectively in the Committee on Legislative Matters. So I would ask for a motion to amend the order that's on the floor with what I just described. So moved. Is there a second to that? Second. Okay. Any discussion on the amended rules order? Bidwell. Um, I like the consistency and the stripped down nature of it. It all makes sense to me. Um, I particularly commend uh, the addition of language talking about the powers of committee to hold hearings and to adding develop, review, and recommend policies mm -hmm. on. It's always been implicit, but it's an example to me of taking something that's implicit and highlighting it uh, to remind ourselves collectively that uh, we can and should be using our committees to, in fact, look at issues <coughs> and develop policy there, uh, rather than just uh, hold a discussion on already formulated policy. So I uh, applaud the intent of that addition. Thank you. A any other discussion? Councilor Klein, then Councilor LaBarge. I just have a quick question, 2.6.1.1.5. Um, the committee may hold public hearings on water, sewer, stormwater, and so on. Yes. Um, why is that not shall? Because aren't we obligated to hold those hearings? Um, we are, but we could choose to do it as a full city council, which might be, in the case of finance, a, distinct, a distinction without a difference, and finance so often just meets in the full city council. But I wanted to give us the option to either do it in a committee, and it could be a special meeting of the finance committee, or do it in the full council. Thank you. Certainly. Councilor Bart. That was my question about finance committee about holding a special meeting. Yep. We'll still be obligated to hold a hearing on those things. So. so on the Committee on City Service, it's going to be called Committee on City Service and Public Works? Nope. Uh, because we would amend it. There's a document that, sh a two page yeah. document that shows various amendments. Um, call it. We can pull it up. We have pulled it up. Thank you very much. Um, Wait, are you looking for the other, the unamended? The we want the amended. We want to make sure Council Labarge uh, has reviewed the amended version, which is what we're looking at right now. The, the title of the committee would stay the same, same Council. Its jurisdiction would be rephrased. Um, well, Councillor, is this some? Do do you want to return to this, or do you have a specific question that maybe I, I could answer? Well, because I have not had the opportunity to see. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, um, how would you feel most comfortable proceeding? I would. I would like to be able to explain it to you. You know, so you definitely, it's important for you to understand. Um, can I walk? I just want to know, mm -hmm. on the committee on um, city services, mm -hmm. the board of public, I mean the Department of Public Works, mm -hmm. are we going to be holding hearings? 
No, not necessarily. Um, the only change, the only substantive change for city services is actually not even a substantive change. It's a stylistic change, mostly. Uh, it's about the jurisdiction, which would read, quote, matters related to the activities and operation of municipal government. So to answer your question, that would involve public works in addition to everything that city services already has jurisdiction over. But you wouldn't be required to hold hearings, per se. You would kind of operate as you do, as you do now. It's possible that public works issues could be referred to that committee. But I think we all know that doesn't really happen very often um, in the history of the council, recent history anyway. So, so may I, please, um, yeah, if uh, you would. Just for example, Councillor Labarge, um, the um, city services uh, committee, in addition to having the, the uh, forms that uh, forms on the recreational marijuana use, mm -hmm. um, both at community resources and at legislative matters, we thought that at city services, given our jurisdiction over not jurisdiction, but uh, yeah, I guess we do call it jurisdiction over public safety and um, health matters that we invite in the Department of Health and the police chief. And so that's a way of, uh, you know, that's a way of using our jurisdiction to address a, a citywide issue related to city departments. But this also be the responsibility for city services since the mayor brought it up in regards here at city council of looking at the ordinance on the stormwater fee. Will that be the responsibility of this committee? It's possible. That's what I thought. It's possible, yes. Because public works would be, you know, it's general, the way it's phrased, matters related to the activities and operation of municipal government. Uh, Councilor Dwight and then Councilor Bidwell. It's also not inappropriate for, for instance, the hearings to be held in finance or in full council as well. I mean, what this does is it allows the flexibility for us to try and determine the most appropriate, you know, form in which to conduct those hearings. So it's, it, it gives you that wiggle room that we didn't necessarily have before. Councilor Bidwell? Well, I was going to make a similar point that it, it basically in describing city services as uh, having a jurisdiction involving operation of municipal government and community resources matters affecting the community well obviously there's many many issues that affect both and could go either way so effectively what this does is leave considerable discretion to the to the council and the referral process based on what committees are already loaded with what to figure out where the appropriate place is and I think it's that's probably appropriate to have that wiggle room any other discussion on the amended order um, six votes will be required to <coughs> amend the rules, uh, and only one vote is required. So six councilors voting in the affirmative one time is what does it. So if there are no other comments, uh, I'd like to ask for a roll call on this order. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy is not present. <coughs> Councilor Nash. Okay, uh, so those rules are amended unanimously. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, now let's skip back up to, let's see if I can find my place here, 18.015 in order to make various amendments to the council <coughs> rules. Um, this is where it's a, there's a little twist because the Committee on Legislative Matters made a positive recommendation on this order but it was a recommendation as amended, essentially striking everything within the order. The one thing that was left was to suggest to strike section 3.2, which had to do with the state legislative agenda, but that has already been stricken previously. I think the reason is perhaps the amendments were made to a, a slightly out of date version of the rules. So as a result, the amendment that Legislative Matters offered basically make, makes no change to the rules. And for that reason, I'd like to do, uh, for this one, what we did with the other one, 
And I'd like to ask for a motion to put the original order that the sponsors introduced on the floor. Made by Second. Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Klein. And I would like to defer the sponsors, uh, Councillor Bidwell perhaps, to introduce the order and his rule changes. Um, sure. There, there, do you want me to talk about all of them or do you want to take them one at a time? Well, let's, um, <coughs> what's the preference of the council? I think certainly legislative matters has been through this with a fine tooth comb. I could do it all at once. Um, maybe you could walk through them all and then if there are ones of interest, counselors, we could stop and discuss it further. I, I, as I think about it, I think th th there are such different issues pertaining to them that I think it might be appropriate to take them one at a time. Um, but if you would like me to offer my preview of them all at once, I'd be glad to do so. It's so. entirely up to you, so please. As I said when these were initially introduced, um, the, the, the spirit of both the, the language on committee study request uh, and on uh, referral of various matters to committees uh, was that we as a council, um, I think are best served in the public, more importantly, is best served when we do take time to deliberate and when we do uh, make referrals to committee to allow for additional input, additional voices to be heard, additional public participation. Um, and I know there's been some concern that this would be regarded as some kind of delaying tactic, and I think it's anything but. I think, I think the, the objective, uh, both with a suggestion that we rely more on committee study requests and that we more often than we have accustomed to make referrals to committees, is based on a desire to maximize uh, the variety and the quantity of public participation. And when we bring matters directly to the council and when councillors uh, themselves maybe realize something is on the agenda, a resolution, for example, for a vote uh, with just two or three days' notice, there really is very little opportunity to get the public involved if we immediately go to a vote. So the spirit of both of these uh, is using proper discretion, because every situation is different, but using discretion to make referrals to committees so we can allow for, for, for appropriate uh, participation. And indeed, I'll say with regard to the committee study request, it's very much in, in, in line with the, the, the language that we just talked about, uh, where we uh, explicitly now say that one of the powers of a committee is to formulate policy. And that's, uh, I think, one of the strengths of the committee study request to say, here is a complicated issue, rather than rush immediately to language of resolution or ordinance, let's set it to a committee and, and get a lot of input before we do that. So I would offer that as my introduction both to uh, 2.3.8 with regard to committee study request and the rationale for um, making explicit, as opposed to it being implicit, that any counselor at any time can recommend to the council as a whole that a matter be referred to committee. Um, so I, do, would you, would the, would the chair prefer discussion on those matters now or uh, going through the whole thing? It's a, it's a little tricky because ultimately we have to vote on it and there's no easy way to kind of just split it up into multiple orders. So the only way I could think to actually vote on each one would um, to be actually what the Legislative Matters Committee did, which is have a motion to delete each one, and if you like it, you could vote no. That's kind of the strange situation that we're in. Councilor Dwight. Procedurally, though, we, uh, we can amend on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, so if these are presented as the whole, and if separately that people took issue or wanted to modify or enhance, mm -hmm. Um, that would be an amendment made on the floor, so I don't, Okay. right? I mean, That's certainly true. If the sponsors are comfortable with that, we could take the order as a whole. It is on the floor as a whole now, right? but amendments would to the, to the any part of it would be in order. Exactly. In other words, one, one type of an amendment would be to strike a particular section of the, of the, of the order. 
that would that, that would be the way we would get at picking and choosing. Okay. So any further discussion of it? No, on, on just those two items. Which are those the only two items that, that I introduced? 2.3 mm -hmm. and 5.2.1, and I did that kind of on the fly because they're related in spirit. Okay. The spirit of more referrals to committee for <coughs> input and deliberation. Okay. Um, any discussion on, we, could, we can, for the sake of facilitating it, limit it to those parts of the ordinance for, uh, order for now. Uh, Council Shara. So, so 2.3 and 5.2.1? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll move to 5.2.1 then. Um, the referrals, so from what I, I, first of all, I apologize, I couldn't be at legislative matters. I didn't have child care, so I couldn't be there. Um, what I've, I heard that the criticism on 5.2.1 um, was that it, it was unnecessary, and actually I don't really disagree with that. Um, but as I, I said before, when we first introduced it a couple weeks ago, um, I, I think it's worth having a conversation about referral of non-ordinances to committee or commission. Um, it's a topic that's come up twice fairly recently, and, uh, but always within a motion that was on the floor to refer something, so it's not an appropriate time to, to discuss or debate the rule itself. Um, and there's also been discussion from the public about uh, referrals in the last couple of years or so, so it seemed like an appropriate time to have the conversation. Um, and I think, you know, I think the start of the term when we vote on the rules is a logical time to have, have a conversation. Um, it seems to me that as a body, the responsible thing to do is to discuss something that has raised questions um, to see if it's something that we do want to amend. Uh, one of the sort of weird or challenging things about the work that we do is that when something comes up as we're debating something else, we can't discuss it because it it's not on our agenda. Um, and it's also uh, likely that we can't discuss it outside of a public meeting. So this was a vehicle for allowing that discussion. Um, I personally like the flexibility of the current rule, but I'm open to hearing from my colleagues thoughts on why they might want to make it more restrictive on either end of the spectrum, whether must always be referred, never should be referred. Um, my argument for the rule as it stands is that I think it can be useful for some, though definitely not all resolutions to be referred. Um, and in fact, there's power in sometimes not referring them. Resolutions have a malleability that, um, that I think makes them a useful tool for the council. And I think that some should be considered for referral, uh, especially if they're meant to encourage or discourage a direct impact on Northampton or are meant to be a larger, maybe philosophical conversation about Northampton, like the vibrant sidewalk resolution was. Um, but I also want to take a minute to, know, and I apologize if you've all heard me talk about this before, um, but it, I'm still struck by it. I want to note that we don't always know the impact of a resolution, um, what, you know, what the impact will be. And the events that were set in motion by the 2015 welcoming of refugees resolution had a profound effect. Um, there are people, families, children living in our community and not in a refugee camp because of the, that initial action started a chain of events. Um, to <laughs> me, that's profound and, um, and it still fills me with awe. I'm ever mindful that an action that might be taken for granted as being aspirational or derided as some as a waste of time or frivolous or something outside the scope of what the council should be working on um, can have a very tangible impact. And in that case, it was, it was a beautiful one for people's lives and for our community. Um, that is not to question whether that particular resolution should or shouldn't have gone to committee, but instead to illustrate that resolutions are not just aspirational in the sense that they're sort of cute wishes that we send out on thought clouds <coughs> to, uh, you know, into the ether. They, um, they, they have recipients, and they can have a direct impact, and it's possible that we won't know that impact or that the impact is, uh, is unforeseen by us. For, and I say this because Catholic Charities in Springfield wasn't named in that resolution. Um, they weren't necessarily an intended recipient, but they still received it and they acted on it, and we're thankful for that. Um, <clears throat> so again, to the flexibility of the tool of a resolution, there's merit in having a vehicle for a quick 
um, non-binding statement or declaration of the council, and, or to use it to reaffirm past resolutions, and, um, and to do it in a moment when the community is looking for that sort of leadership for us, and we want to be able to act quickly on that. Um, examples of that are uh, the safe and accepting community resolution that was a week after the presidential election um, that was responding to a rise in hate incidents. And, uh, and then another one is about a year ago, shortly after the inaugural, condemning the travel ban executive order. Um, so I think it can be reasonable for a counselor to move for, for a non-legislative matter to committee for further discussion um, or information or more public input. But they, that counselor should be able to articulate why they think further exploration is either necessary or beneficial for that resolution or other matter. Um, and then of course it's up to a vote for among us. So the majority of us have to decide if we agree. So again, I'm interested in hearing other people's thoughts on this. Um, if no one else wants to have that conversation, <coughs> that's also fine. As I said, I, I just, I like the rule as it stands, but I think it was, I, don't, I didn't feel like it was right to leave that question or concern hanging or not acknowledged um, or discussed. So this was the tool for that. Thank you. Um, I, would, I could give my opinion on it. Um, my opinion is currently any counselor already has the ability to refer any matter um, to committees or executive multiple member bodies. Um, so th this is not a necessary rule change, mm -hmm. I think as the counsel from Ward 4 mentioned, um, although she also highlighted some of the benefits from, from emphasizing it. But the reason that I would avoid doing that is because Mo while motions to refer are generally um, allowable for any matter, they're not always in order. For example, if we're in the middle of a motion to adjourn, that's maybe a bad example because there's no discussion on adjournment. <laughs> but you'll see there are, there are times when you can't just refer something that's been previously, you know, considered or that kind of thing. All those details about when certain motions are in order Referral is a, is a subsidiary mode. First you have uh, a main motion to get something on the floor as we often do, and, and referral like amendment or continuance or whatever are secondary motions. So we actually have an informal habit in the council of treating referrals like main motions. Sometimes we don't even put things on the floor. We just say we want to refer them. Um, in my opinion, you know, while we need to refer some things, we, it could be better for us to get in the habit of describing what it is we're actually referring to start with, but digressing a little bit, my concern is that if we have this rule, it kind of makes it seem like referral is always in order, no matter what, and that would not be the case. So that's my technical concern. Uh, Councilor Bidwell, then Councilor Dwight. Uh, just, just to, just to, as, as, as a response to that, Councilor O'Donnell. I mean that we, we went out of our way to say any counselor may recommend. I don't think that could be construed as as uh, suggesting that it's going to happen. As, 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 as we've discussed, it merely points out what is already there, and in that case, it's not necessary. Uh, in the same way that um, your addition of language on what are the powers of committee, we always know knew that a power of a committee included developing, reviewing, and recommending policies. But I think it was wise, nevertheless, to highlight it as a reminder to us all that committees can, in fact, do that. I see this as, as uh, similar. It, it takes something that has already been there, but it just calls it out and reminds us that, uh, in fact, we have that ability. Uh, now, by virtue of having had this discussion, maybe we've accomplished our goal. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to go to the wall on it because it just, it just only, you know, states what we already know. But nevertheless, by virtue of having this conversation and ideally including it in the language, we remind us all that um, there are instances, and as Councillor uh, Sher has pointed out, they're not always appropriate for referral, but oftentimes they are appropriate for referral. It reminds us that we should do it when we can. So may I ask a question then so before I go to Councillor Dwight? <clears throat> when, so when you say recommend, you mean recommend, not, not make a motion? So this is, is that what you mean? Or? It, the, I, I would consider them as identical, uh, okay. the, meaning the same thing. Uh, any counselor may make a motion. Okay. If you would be more comfortable with that language, 
that would work just fine. No, that, that, that's my concern is that they are confused. And then, I then, 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 then I would suggest a friendly amendment to my own language to make it clear that any counselor may make a motion. No, that, that, that's what worries me more. Huh? Yeah. Sorry, I'm not. I thought I was trying to address your concern, uh, no, Councilor. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. No, my concern is that Robert's rules already. I mean, we have a book this thick. Not all of it's about referral, but we have a, a fairly comprehensive description of when an or, a motion to refer is and is not an order. And my concern is that this conflicts with the Roberts Rules of Order. That um, you know to. I did a little bit of research. In the very beginning, the first section of our rules, we have a section called precedents. Uh, this says, city council meetings shall conform to parliamentary practices as set forth in the rules of the council. The procedures defined in the most recent current version of Robert's Rules of Order, you know, supplement those. So that's my concern about stating again what is kind of a plenary, well-accepted power of, of legislative bodies that are governed by Robert's Rules to uh, make referrals. Um, just that's my concern, Councilor Dwight. Um, yeah, I, I mean, my concern here is is that we're parsing a language that doesn't need to be parsed to essentially transmit the same understanding and mission. And um, and actually, I'm grateful for Councilor Shera's point because actually, uh, uh, to to prompt the discussion about clarity, there was there was discussion. There was some resistance, of course, when the uh, uh, resolution that was also paired with um, uh, the ordinance for the uh, security cameras. There was some discussion about the uh, the fact that resolutions is a rule. There was, but to employ that term as a rule is not appropriate because it was essentially a legacy thing. It wasn't. It wasn't actually prescribed in the rules. It's, it was a legacy thing. But in, and I think, unfortunately, and I, I think I'm complicit in this. Um, implied that essentially it was it was in opposition of what was understood as the rules. Important in fact actually it was it just ran counter to what we were used to, which is a really bad way to function ultimately. Um, so I'm glad and I'm I'm appreciative of the prompt. The uh, to uh, Councillor Bidwell's point about the fact that we always knew and understood um, the change that you propose in your uh, that, that subcommittees can actually develop and create um, policy or, or uh, pass on ordinances. That wasn't true. We didn't always know that. Big point in fact, that wasn't actually embedded in the rules until they were redrafted by the council president. Uh, relatively new. That was not actually embedded. It was not necessarily understood or even uh, laid out that that was a process by which a bottom-up kind of influence on how we legislate. It was usually came top-down. It was some right. uh, sponsors would introduce, it would get referred to committee, get vetted there, but a boom, which is um, the language now that was established uh, when Councilor O'Donnell rewrote the rules uh, allows for and, and explicitly stated that therein the hope was that also committees could be also be empowered to do the exact same thing. So it wasn't always understood. It was not a given. It wasn't even implicit. Mm -hmm. um, so now it is explicit, and it is, uh, uh, I think, the body is in agreement because we all voted in favor of it uh, originally uh, for, for the rules, um, agrees with that idea. So my, I mean, my hope here is that um, maybe taking a cue from Councilor Bidwell is at least maybe the discussion will increase uh, an expanded awareness about what this means, but I, I honestly see no reason to change the existing language at all. I mean, as we've said, they virtually say the same thing, although th with different emphasis. And um, I see no no reason to change this one. Uh, Councilor Large. I have to agree with um, Councilor Dwight also. And even with the statement he made about not knowing, I didn't either. Any other discussion on this provision? We've also kind of decided to discuss the first part of uh, the sponsor's proposal, which has to do with the committee study request. Any comments on that? Uh, Councilor Dwight. In legislative matters, there were a few problems with this because this actually comes under the um, 
a, a particular section that refers to the council president, the powers conferred upon the council president. <clears throat> and so the one, the, the intent of this is actually that is implicit and in fact saved in other portions of the rules. And to put it in this section kind of uh, dilutes the original process by which we're, we're identifying the president's authority or um, obligations. Um, that was part of the that was part of the discussion and legislative matters of the objection to this is that it it it, uh, it kind of muddies the waters, particularly as it's it's as it's iterated throughout the rules. That was one of the concerns, and again, also the concern about redundancy. It's it is it is as explicit in in other portions of the rules. Um, repeating it here in a different variation actually didn't seem appropriate. Councilor Sharon. Sorry, can I just ask for clarification? So were you saying that putting committee study requests under the council president duties muddies the waters? Yeah, insofar as that any counselor can do that. And to put it, the, this is now ascribing a certain specific power to the council president that, that was already implied, but then also seems to imply there's a certain greater authority for that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was already under that, right? It was. It was yeah, right. yeah, it's always understood. Okay. Right. Yeah, so that section, committee studies requests were already under the council president's powers and duties. As as was understood that I believe that with the rest of us actually, wait, let me look at this. I'm trying to remember what the original objections were. So in the um, meantime, we'll go to council. Yeah. May I just... Uh, from my recap of, of our conversation on legislative matters, I think we really just looked at, yeah, the redundancy that because this is this is already under the section of council president powers and duties, it isn't necessary to qualify the first duty being to issue, or one of those powers and duties, to issue a committee study request by then saying that in you know, in the judgment of, we thought that the amended language in the, when in the judgment of the president, a complex policy suggests doing research, we didn't feel it was necessary to define it at that point. That's what I recall is our, um, the gist of our conversation. Councilor I also brought up a point in the legislative matters committee about um, creating a, a <clears throat> that this language creates more of a sense of hierarchy of you know, clearly it is the president's duty to um, to issue the request ultimately because that's kind of a logistical matter. But um, with this language, when in the judgment of the president, a complex policy, whatever, so that it becomes, you know, something that just the president has kind of domain or jurisdiction mm -hmm. over to make a decision about. And, you know, I'm thinking about um, <clears throat> issuing I'd like to, just as an example, um, issue a study request, or I'm interested in a committee doing a study. I would, of course, consult. I would come to the president. I would consult with him. We would have a discussion about it. And we could kind of make that decision, I would hope, collaboratively <laughs> and collectively. So just, I feel like we need to be increasing this spirit of collaborative work amongst all of us and to lessen the kind of hierarchical um, language that says, you know, the president, when he makes the decision. So that, that to me, just felt unnecessary, essentially, um, especially as um, Councillor Dwight and Councillor Carney already said that it's redundant because it's within the, the uh, responsibilities of the president already. Well, uh, one and just one more quick piece just about the no later than 120 days from the referral we didn't see any difference between that language and within 120 days and that's why we struck both of those changes um, if I may give my <coughs> perspective and, and some history um, I, I kind of created the committee study request mechanism with Councillor Dwight in 2015 and it went into effect in 2016. And its purpose was, um, and what Councilor Bigwell was getting out earlier about asking committees to generate ideas. 
committees were kind of receptacles where we would throw things and say, please, you know, please study this and give us a recommendation. Sometimes the recommendations would be excellent. Sometimes they would be sort of uh, perfunctory. We thought committees should be generating things as well. So the committee study request goes to a committee, like the one to the, uh, the Committee on Community Resources, and says, please convene a meeting, series of meetings on the local economy. Bring people together, study various issues, it's up to you what, and bring forward some ideas. It could be a report, it could be legislation, whatever. My concern with this, acknowledging the good, the good intentions behind looking at it, my, my concern, um, and I try and put pride of authorship away, <coughs> To, or to the side, my concern is it turns that kind of process back into a referral process, up to and including the 120-day phrase. It says, no later than 120 days from referral. Well, it's not a referral. It's a committee study request. And so that's my problem, is that it turns it into, you know, could be anything. Could be any work the council wishes to ask a committee to undertake, and it turns it into, when in the judgment of the president, a complex policy issue suggests research or testimony. In my view, it, it was intended to be more than that and more of an active process, and that's the basis of my concern. So. Any other discussion? Shall we move to other provisions of the, the order? Or Okay. Um, well, I'll ask the, spon the lead sponsor again if he wishes to, to introduce some of the, the two remaining provisions. Um. State legislative priorities. Uh, just, just for the record, um, there was there was no confusion about whether that previous language had been stricken. Okay. As a matter of fact, it, it says right here, deleted from council rules in 2017. It was just listed there as a reference point. Got it. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so we we knew all along that, that 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 was not the existing rule, but it was a reference point for for what we wanted to propose, which was that. When that was our council rule, we never really did it. The, the intent was good, but we just never followed through on it as a body. Um, and so there was no point in trying to resurrect that. It didn't work before, it wouldn't work now, but what we thought would work, um, and as I've mentioned, I've consulted with the mayor about this and, and, and he would be agreeable as well, to at least a couple times a year uh, invite the mayor for a conversation about what the mayor sees as the city's legislative priorities, and we can have a conversation about it. As I've, as I've said before, many of us find ourselves uh, in situations where we have conversations with our state senator or our state rep or other members of the legislature. And it would be, I would find it nice to be, when I, when I do have the opportunity to grab someone's ear for five minutes, to have some to be armed with some sense of, uh, of collective um, sense of what are our real priorities here. Uh, if, I can, if, I can, if I can lobby our state rep, what's at the top of the list? Um, so that was the spirit in which this was, was offered. It would be very informal, uh, it would not generate a, any kind of formal resolution or any formal action. It would merely be a, a, a sort of a, a collaborative conversation with the mayor about legislative priorities. Thank you. Discussion, Councilor Shera, and then Councilor Nash. Um, again, uh, um, like I said before, I you know I thought that Councilor O'Donnell's original idea had not only been a good one, but that our last term provided evidence that, um, based on what we had produced, that there was interest not only from us but from the community in us using our voice to weigh in on state legislation um, or matters that were before state boards. And I speculate that the increased interest in state legislation has to do with trying to protect the Commonwealth um, and our city from um, or resist against the, the federal situation. Um, and I'm fully in favor of us as a body being more informed as to how to do that effectively and on what issues, and um, this would create an opportunity to have that conversation regularly. So that's, that was my reason for supporting this. Thank you. Councillor Nash. Um, so uh, in legislative matters, Councillor O'Donnell, um, well, part of, there was some back and forth uh, about um, uh, <coughs> the, the, the language that was here and whether or not it was going, it, it, it was effective 
as written, whether it should also include some uh, a look at city priorities as well. Um, but um, that while that back and forth was going on, Councillor O'Donnell offered to um, to actually uh, start practicing this process and start putting it in place, and then we would consider whether or not it became something to add to our rules. And as the representative of the, the sponsors at that, at legislative matters, I, I felt that was a, an appropriate action. And um, so. Good, thank you. Um, Councilor Dwight. Uh, just to add to that, uh, that's, that's actually a, a, a very good capsulation of, the, of what was discussed. It was also um, the reason this one basically was deleted was more for the fact that there was uh, considered an opportunity to actually expand and build on it because we all I think we all agreed that there is uh, and we're trying to figure out how it would be formalized and so to uh, have Council O'Donnell uh, the, as council president do more informally because it's, again this is embedded in the rules we ha we can do that we can ask uh, the mayor to come in mm -hmm. to speak to these matters and invite him to do such but then we could actually embed it in the rules to encompass things as uh, Councilor Klein has suggested was to expand it for municipal priorities, discussing municipal priorities, what's the mayor's projected vision for mm -hmm. um, the coming years and so on and so forth and get reports back and where, the, where, I mean we hear from him when he speaks on issues of the budget and, we, and he gives his presentations but there's opportunity to have uh, a broader discussion again to all be on the same page, to all to pull the oars in the same direction. So this wasn't um, this wasn't essentially a rejection. It was a, it was actually just removing for the opportunity to to um, to build on and practice uh, uh, by agreement from the council president. Put it, put into practice as we go. Um, and then it, it, it and I have to say that we were confused. We did see the note of deletion, but we weren't really clear on it. We we. On, on rechecking, we found that it didn't exist, that this, this item had been deleted. The, that created further confusion that was already piled on confusion, so we had. Um, but, and again, I think we all agreed that the original intent was good, at least had the right idea. Um, it was never put into practice effectively. And um, I think uh, Given what we were facing with a significant change in the in the western part of the state's delegation in the legislature, mm -hmm. um, we would be well served as we are kept up to date and apprised of those of the issues that are pending before before them, and that that would. And I would also add, I would change uh, the word benefit. I would say the word change it to the word effect, because as we've discovered. Not often, it, very, it doesn't very often benefit us. We do not benefit, we are actually impacted in how we react to those impacts would be what, one of the things that we might change further down the line. Anyone who hasn't spoken? Councilor Klein. One really quick point of clarification or maybe amplification is that um, we said this already existed, in fact, it had been uh, taken out and it hadn't worked and that was why we, and so we didn't want to set ourselves up again to have this language that we might not um, carry forward. But at the same time, we had the council president there saying that he wanted to take responsibility to try and put this into effect. Um, and as somebody said, we kind of experiment with it and we can put it back in if we feel like it's something that works. And he is taking the responsibility to try and make it work. Mm -hmm. So that was why we thought it was just not necessary to be there. Um. I would be definitely, for, speak for myself, far more comfortable with that approach. The other thing is the original intention was for the council to figure out what it thought was important. Now, it's, it's very important to listen to the mayor who is knowledgeable and has access to things that we don't. But it, it changes somewhat when it becomes not about putting together our own set of priorities, which could include municipal priorities as opposed to, and in addition to legislative priorities, as Councillor Klein points out, um, but rather just kind of, again, passively receiving the priorities from someone else, our colleague, our, our peer, someone we respect and want to hear from, but we will, we will hear that. My concern about our rules is more about, can we create a process 
to generate those ideas and discussion ourselves. One thing I floated is can we use uh, a select committee model where we have counselors, maybe if the mayor agrees, designees from the mayor's office, and citizens to have this discussion about what our priorities should be. So I don't know that the, this is in a form that I'm comfortable supporting because of those unanswered questions about how it would work. That is my two cents on that one. Any other discussion on that, or shall we move to 4.7? Uh, I would invite one of the sponsors to introduce that provision. Well, I'll, I'll start off, and, and, and knowing that the other sponsors, particularly Councilor Nash, were actually at legislative matters, and I, too, regret that I wasn't able to, to be there at that meeting. I was out of town. But I will um, just mention a couple of things. The first has to do with... Um, the motivation for this. Um, much has been said uh, about what are assumed to have been uh, the motivations for, for, for suggesting this. Um, but let me be clear, and my co-sponsors will speak for themselves, that in fact I take very seriously that this is the the, the people's forum. This is, this is where we conduct the people's business. Um, and I think part of that means that we should do everything we can to increase opportunities for public participation. That's why I feel the way I do about referring things to committees. Um, but I think in council chambers themselves, we need to do everything we can to encourage public participation. And one of the very specific motivators of this was that uh, in our in our meetings in the fall, I heard and others did too, that in some instances, members of the of, of of the public of the audience here here in council chambers were having difficulty hearing what was going on as we were deliberating, because of because of conversations that were going on in the audience. Um, we also heard in some instances that folks came here to observe what was going on in council chambers. And we're having difficulty seeing if something was 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 held up. They didn't care about the content of what was being held up. The fact that it was blocking their view. Um, so I think the motivation uh, on my part was to do everything possible to encourage the the the, the sense that that this is council chambers where uh, anybody can come and be and be heard and can hear what's going on and can see what's going on. And a secondary motivation was that uh, we ourselves as counselors, uh, particularly my colleagues who sit at that end and closest to the audience, sometimes have had difficulty actually hearing one another speak because of conversation going on out there. So um, there have been many, many motivations attributed, but, but that's, that was what my, my, my thinking was. There's also been some, <coughs> some concern, I, heard, I understand, expressed at uh, legislative matters about the, the, the suspicious timing of, of, of bringing this up now. Well, the fact of the matter is that in January, every two years, when we convene a new council um, or swear in a new council, that's where we traditionally revisit <coughs> our council rules. It's where we adopt rules for that session. And as two years ago, there were a number of rule changes, some of which we've discussed here tonight, they were introduced by Councilor O'Donnell in January. That's the time you do rule changes. So the, the fact that there was anything you know, ulterior about the timing of doing it now, it's when we do rule changes in January every two years. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that. I do think that um, it makes sense for us to have some greater specificity for everybody's benefit of what we consider the, um, our, our definition of, of decorum and treating one another with, with civility and, and respect in council chambers. Thank you very much. Councilor <coughs> Sherry. Um, I'm, I'm fine with the determination maybe for legislative matters that um, that this is redundant. Um, and 
through this exploration of this topic, uh, you know, we, I find that we need to recognize that this is actually covered under open meeting law in mass general law, um, which of course we are we're sworn to recognize that. Um, but per perhaps not everyone's aware of it. Mass general law covers a lot. Um, I'm extremely proud that our council, that at our council, no one is ever turned away from speaking or is constrained at public comment beyond the time limit that we have, which is in place to ensure equal time and opportunity for everybody. Um, that, as we've sort of heard reference tonight, that's actually kind of unusual for a legislative body. Um, many, many of them have very complicated procedures um, and procedures for even signing up for public comment or limits as to what you can discuss um, or other sorts of rules for their public participation and we don't have that and I'm very proud of that. Um, everyone has an equal right to speak and to participate with us and equal access to open meetings and to public process is essential to open government and, and everybody should be afforded um, the same opportunity for that. That includes being able to see um, and hear others speak. Asking people to allow others to have the same opportunity they have uninterrupted and not impeded is not squelching of participation in my view. Thank you. Um, Councillor Nash and then Councillor Labarge. Thank you. Um, so as somebody who attended legislative matters the other day and um, as the lone sponsor that um, the, the, the tenor of the discussion is a little bit different here. Um, that it's uh, collegial, um, that uh, we're speaking to the rules and that are before us and um, that I, I really appreciate that. Um, I do, I, I also want to recognize that this, this particular piece in our um, uh, suggested amendments here um, r really impacted the way that the other amendments were interpreted that um, that that this raised a lot of su suspicions and that um, that uh, that referrals and new rules uh, by the council president which were really meant to just enhance public process um, uh, were were colored with a um, suspicious um, cast to them so um, and uh, that uh, that um, you know I, I, I think that may have been an error on our part to couple those because I think it uh, it really impacted those other discussions um, around this particular uh, piece right here that um, well first I want to speak to some things from um, that are around things that were presented at um, legislative matters the other day, um, that I presented documents that other cities and towns use for rules. The rules that we, to demonstrate that what we were proposing here was actually very minuscule and um, in, in relation to what goes on in other um, progressive cities and towns that we all respect and look up to. Um, I also shared um, the, the document that, um, the rule that Councillor Shera referred to having to do with mass general law and conduct. And, um, and that, in fact, we're already legally bound by that. Mm -hmm. um, and that, um, so, and I, I still believe that some guidelines for the public when they in any meeting is a good thing i've sat in a lot of meetings i haven't sat on council for a long time but i've sat in a lot of public meetings um, committee meetings open meetings and that by and large the the ones that do the best are the ones that simply say here's how we're going to work and here's here's how we're going to interact and um, that um, that I, I in the paper today um, 
our council president, Councillor O'Donnell, feels like he has the, the tools to, um, to actually meet the existing language. And, um, and I, th I trust him on that. Um, and that, um, that, but I, 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 I asked this the other day, and I, I, I will repeat that request that, um, that as the council president, you uh, develop some sort of guidelines to share with the public. I, I think it's always very helpful. Um, that, so it, and it's been an interesting process for me. I've, I've had a real learning experience here that sometimes we get hyper, uh, uh, the language, we, st we start, what's going on on the national stage, we look for it here amongst us. And I, I know everybody in this room, we, we are not, who, <laughs> we are not the enemy that's going on at the national level. And, um, and that I'm just asking that people keep that in mind, that the differences between us in this room is minuscule compared to what we're all struggling with. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Labarge, were you? Yes. Um, under 4.7 on conduct, city councillors and members of the public shall conduct themselves with civility and respect at all times. As far as being a city councillor for a long period of time and also working with Councillor Dwight, we've always, council president, always talked about being respectful. And I've never had a problem with the public until recently with the surveillance cameras. My only problem I had is when this whole room was packed, in other words, people actually sitting on the floor and clicking their fingers, which did affect my hearing aids very badly. But I approached three of the girls and told them that it really affected me. They were very polite, I have to say this, and they did not do it. I have a problem when, and I've never seen this happen, where a counselor actually told them, go ahead, hold, hold up your signs. That I felt was rude. I felt that was a rude conduct of a counselor to do that. And when we're talking about working together and having respect, then there should be respect from counselors also with people holding signs. But that counselor actually said, go ahead, hold them up. So they did. <laughs> and I kept more up. So that gets people going. I, I think that our city council, no matter, not just because you're council president, Councilor Dwight has always done a wonderful job. People were able to come up and feel very freely about speaking and respect. And that's what I'm hoping that this will come out of this. And everybody has rights to speak in front of that podium with respect. Thank you. And I didn't have a problem with any conduct at all except for the clicking of the fingers. And that was settled immediately. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone who hasn't spoken? Um, Councillor um, On this point, actually, I, I think one of the most salient points that was brought up, actually, uh, by the public, um, and then reiterated on the Council floor, these are the Council's rules. These are the council's rules. These are the rules that are um, how we are going to the public, not the rules of the public. Now, that, that said, this is our deliberative body. This is where we do the work, and we need the best circumstances in which to work and to do that work. There were a number of problems that were brought out, and, and, you know, and I think some get all confused and muddied, and some might be have other agendas or whatever, but the hearing issue. This room is problematic. It's always been problematic. We've been working always. very hard to try and at least improve and enhance some some means of uh, providing, principally for the the public to be able to attend and hear and see meetings. Um, the the this was space was not designed for what we do here. Uh, the sound system, we can't 
turn up those speakers back there because it creates a shrieking uh, feedback sound, which may at times seem on a par with the debate. But it's the it, it is it's essentially that's a that's a logistical technical problem that we won't put in the rules, but it is part of the thing that inspires, um, uh, as Councilor Bidwell has said, inspires part of the change of the proposed changes. Um, that, and I've uh, been in consultation with uh, uh, Councilor O'Donnell, I sent him a, uh, <laughs> uh, Jen's thanking me from back in the, in the studio for mentioning what about the feedback sound. Um, the, there are systems that exist for wireless uh, headsets, which we investigated a couple years ago. They were, they were prohibitively um, expensive, and we don't have a budget, uh, by the way. We have a budget to hire an accountant and to pay us, and that's it. But the fact is, is now it's well within means, and I've spoken with Councillor uh, Labarge to bring this up with the uh, Disabilities Commission to discuss the prospect of improving and enhancing sound here, particularly for people who are challenged with... Uh, hearing impairments so it, it back to the original point was that we make rules for ourselves we hope and ask and invite the public to um, respect the, the decorum but at the same time I mean we just actually we had a public comment section that I don't think anyone would have any objection to the applause that was provided for the people who testified um, in support of the resolution. Um, I think we're all moved by it. I think the demonstrations that disturb us, ones that run counter to what we are advocating, and I've been on that other side before a bunch of times, are the ones that tend to be the ones that we, we react to and the ones that we're most upset with. And, and it's understandable. They're emotional triggers. You're essentially being called out. We've, uh, you're basically being judged, in, and usually unfairly, but you're being judged and assessed. And to hear from the public to whom you serve, um, it does more than sting. And it inspires reactions. Now, I'm not saying that's what happened here. It's possible it could be. But I don't, I think. What's more important is the optics, as it were, because 90% of po uh, public polity and public conduct is perception. The optics of somehow constraining or discouraging any type of participation in the council is not good. It doesn't, it doesn't actually jive with the rest of this rule, the rest of these rules, or the rest of the ethos that we've often discussed and that we try to prompt and promote. I mean. You know, much has been said about the process that was related to the security cameras, for instance. Um, whereas, you know, I'm, I'm probably in a minority, but I thought that rocked. I actually thought it was good. Not because it went the way that I, uh, that I was endorsing, but because that was a level of participation that had not, I had not seen in these chambers for a long, long time. Right. It continues. We, we had, <laughs> in legislative matters, I have never, ever seen anyone come to talk about how we will establish our rules that's never that's never happened before the public does not come to that <laughs> counselors rarely come to that so the point is that it was there there actually is something wholesome and good about it and as i, I think i've said before democracy tends to be noisy insulting harsh dramatic moving but it's it is given the fact that these are we are all burdened with some sense of emotions hopefully that we and we are reactive creatures with the thing that our job is as counselors principally i think that i've always described to people is essentially to be well some describe as a sounding board i've also said a firewall we're supposed to get flamed we're supposed, and in fact, actually, when I used to preside here, remember, I used to say, you, can, you can't defame anyone else out there. You can defame us. You can say whatever, whatever horrible thing you want to say about us, because we're public figures. And that's established by law. <coughs> but I, I'm more concerned about the message that we are imparting. It's not <clears throat> to promote public discourse. It is to actually put people on notice, the people 
on notice. The people that we're supposedly serving, that we took an oath to represent. And I, don't, I know that's not the intent of the sponsors. I know that. But when you read something, you don't think about the author's intent. You read what you and interpret, and you take from it whatever you see. So that's my concern. That's my principal concern. That's my only concern is the one that, and it was the concern that uh, prompted me to vote to delete this. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments on this? <coughs> Councillor Klein. Um, I have similar concerns to uh, what Councillor Dwight shared. I think uh, putting people on notice, you know, by creating rules that say you shall not, you will not do this, you cannot do this, mm -hmm. um, is a kind of, I use the term in legislative matters, a preemptive admonishment. You know, it's a way of um, preparing people for that they're going to be bad and that they're going to um, be disruptive and, and, you know, that's not acceptable. I mean, I, I think the bottom line is we have something in our rules already that gives um, the council president discretion to address things that are disruptive at a certain point when it's mm -hmm. disruptive beyond our ability to kind of conduct polity. Um, and I think it's sufficient. I, I think that um, naming whether or not people can, you know, they can approve of something or they, they can't approve of something or, or express <coughs> it is just beyond the scope of what we should do if we want to make this a place where people feel welcome to come, where they don't feel intimidated. Mm -hmm. um, bringing the rules to us from other cities, I understand, you know, we want to show that there's precedent, but you can always do, cherry pick those places. And I actually did some research and New York City Council's rules the only thing that they have on decorum is the presiding officer shall preserve order and decorum. In the event of disturbance or disorderly conduct in the chamber, the presiding officer may cause the same to be cleared. So that's very similar to what we have. It essentially gives discretion to the presiding officer um, to act if deemed necessary. And that's the city of New York. That's the city council in New York. Um, so there are other places, in fact, that I think have a, a similar ethos to, to, to Northampton with what we have now. Um, you know, I, this is, I'm starting my third term and I still feel nervous and I would even use the word intimidated to speak every time that I speak in council. And one of the things we heard during the Legislative Matters meeting was um, a couple of people talking about how, how it feels to get up to the podium and to speak mm -hmm. and how intimidating it feels. And that really struck a chord with me because I also feel that way speaking as a counselor. And I just thought to myself, that is such perfect testament to why we absolutely have to make every effort to make people feel like we want to hear what they have to say in whatever way it is expressed. And sometimes it is messy, it is loud, it might be annoying, we might not be able to hear for a moment. But it's not, it, it's, you know, so what if people um, clap for a moment or hiss for a moment? You know, it's the way that people express themselves. Another thing that I think is really important for us to think about is, yes, we're a very white city. We're a very white council. We, um, we, we, we um, conduct ourselves according to kind of white middle class culture. But there are lots of other cultures where we don't have to always behave very nicely and be quiet all the time and listen with something that we call civility. There are all kinds of ways that people need to express themselves and I want to welcome anybody and everybody into this chamber, chambers, um, to, to be able to express themselves how it makes sense to them. Especially because we have, I mean, people are so respectful when they come here. They stick to their three minutes almost all the time and sometimes they run over a little bit and that's okay. And people are usually pretty you know, quiet and they listen really well and they react and they laugh at the jokes. And I mean, it's, it's humans interacting. And so 
I just feel like we don't need to put a finer point on something that we already have in place that has worked. And to address the point about the, that it's not um, coincidental in terms of timing because we're, we, we uh, set our rules at the beginning of a new term, I agree that's absolutely right. But I do think that there is an ulterior, ulterior motive around the causality of why this rule. So maybe not the timing, but I do think that the motive was what happened during the debates around the cameras. And I really take umbrage. I, I think that that it's almost, you know, trying to have the last word because we, you know, certain people didn't like what went on in that mm -hmm. discussion. And I really, you know, I, I don't know. I think that we have to be honest about motivations to make good decisions. Um, I, I think that's, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Anyone else who hasn't spoken? If not, I, I might bloviate a little bit. Um, I think it's, it's no secret where I stand on this, this particular provision. I'm on record in the press um, and in legislative matters as, as opposing it. I, I do oppose it. And I'll list some of my reasons, but at first, I would like to speak to a slightly different point, and that is actually uh, the motivations of my colleagues. Um, I'm reminded of the very first time I, I actually was up at the podium. I've been on the council, this is my fifth year, but I've, I've been a nerd all my life. <laughs> and so I think it was 2011 or something that I actually went to Councillor Dwight, who had just been reelected Councillor at Large and became Council President. And I said, I'm interested in the issue of Citizens United and, and money and politics. It was actually kind of my professional pedigree. I worked for nonprofits on issues like that for a long time. I said, can we do a resolution about this, about the Citizens United versus FEC issue, which if you don't know it, it's essentially what created the super PAC and unleashed a lot of money into the system. The Supreme Court justices who argued for it said, um, it's because money is speech and you, can't have un you can have unlimited money because shouldn't you have unlimited speech? I don't think money is speech, I think money is property. Um, and that's a big difference. Several years later, there's kind of a follow-up, a sequel to the Citizens United decision called McCutcheon versus FEC. Basically expanded the first. But in the dissent on, on that uh, decision, uh, Justice Breyer said something that was uh, very interesting right in the beginning of his dissent. He said that the First Amendment is not just about your individual right to be heard. It's about creating a democratic order in which freedom of speech matters, in which everyone can be heard. And I very much, I, I believe in that. That's why I think we should regulate money in politics. That's why we need to be careful about creating a welcoming environment so all free speech can be heard. It is my opinion, and I told Councillor Nash this in uh, Legislative Matters, that the motivation of the sponsors is more in line with that ideal of creating an environment, a local, in, in, within our local democracy in which voices can be heard. That's my opinion. And I told uh, Councillor Nash in Legislative Matters I respect that. And I've known Councillor Nash and all these folks for a while now. So that's what I think is going on. Notwithstanding that, I, 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 oppose, I oppose this because, well, it's been an interesting learning experience as council president. You know, uh, I, this is what, I'm on uh, month one and a half now. And so you learn a lot. But my, my opinion is that um, in order to both facilitate an individual's right to free speech and the collective democratic space in which free speech matters, the presiding officer, whoever he or she may be, needs discretion and, and needs judgment, needs a set of basic tools that they can use and point to, whether it's mass general law or the existing rule for Point seven, which states, quote, city councilors and members of the public shall conduct themselves with civility and respect at all times. And that's it. 
to me, those are the tools that are required. Additional rules, I think, do send a message, as Councillor Dwight has said. I won't comment on the message that's sent or not sent. But while they may send a message, I don't think they provide any meaningful additional authority to whoever may be chairing a, a committee or the full council to accomplish that goal of facilitating public debate. That's my opinion. I think what we have is good, and we need discretion and judgment about how it's used. Um, but I, I think my colleagues have brought forward something that if you take it at face value, which I do, good conversation to have. How do we have uh, an open and welcoming environment? And I will double down on Councillor Dwight's commitment to increasing access in these chambers. I work with Councillor LaBarge and the Disability Commission to uh, see how we can facilitate um, services and, and assistive um, aids for people with disabilities. I'm happy to do that. I want to do that. That's what we should be doing. I think we have the tools available to us, and so I, I'm going to oppose this provision for those reasons. So, Councilor LaBarge and then Councilor Sharon. Yeah. Um, I just also, because of the hearing difficulties in this room, there also is a problem with NCTV, and this has been going on for a long time. Many, many people have complained of not hearing it, period, at their own homes. So, something is going on. Councilor Sharon. Um, just one other thing I want to say that's sort of in uh, not not necessarily in response to count oh I just realized your name plates are switched um Councillor Klein you're, you're Councillor Nash um <laughs> start, oh, start well, debating well. over <laughs> did, you just, did you have to check my name plate to know what to call me <laughs> and no no laughing just kidding oh. um, we reject the binary so <laughs> not not sort of along the lines, not necessarily in response, but along the lines of what you were saying. And this is something that actually you and I talk about often. Uh, I am always mindful of how hard this is, how hard it is for us, um, how incredibly hard it is from there. And part of what I had in mind was picturing somebody getting up to that podium who was maybe had a different view than the majority of the audience at that moment and how incredibly hard it is to do that, knowing that there's gonna be a, a lot of audible response around you when um, you're saying something that's not gonna be popular in the room. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. There's sort of a flip side to it, that it's incredibly hard to do. And, um, and we all like the positive utterances, but um, if you're already doing something that's really challenging and you know that it's going to be received negatively, um, knowing that being able to carry on while that's happening, I think is incredibly difficult. Councilor Dwight. That's an excellent point, but not someone that we can regulate. And the fact is, is what we do have available to us. Um, and, and in fact, we invited throughout the whole discourse because there were people who were saying that they were intimidated from testifying for a variety of reasons. Um, and we've heard counselors come, come to the defense of people who felt intimidated from, being, from speaking. And what we did is I, I pointed out over many times, and I know Councilor O'Donnell has done as well, is that um, you have the, you st in order to be introduced in the public record, you can also submit written testimony doesn't require you to stand up in public because regardless, even if you're speaking the affirmative or the negative or, and you've got a whole bunch of people behind you, it's terrifying. And I recognize that. And even when I speak now, when I stand at that podium, it's more scary than sitting here. I'm not sure why. There's some psychic problem here with me, but I don't know. <laughs> the fact is, is that there are many ways to convey your opinion and even introduce it to the public record if you like. And in fact, in the letter, you're not constrained at all. You're not required. There's no decorum that's required of you. Mm -hmm. You can say whatever the hell you want for as long as you want. Um, so there are no limits as far as that goes. It's, and as we all acknowledge here, speaking in this room, there's a bit of performance associated with it, comes with it. You're, um, there are responses, there are emotional responses. I imagine most people who speak would hope that they kind of stimulate an emotional response of some sort because that way you know you reflect light 
but it's that is the messiness I was talking about, the noise, the feelings and issues. I mean, that's that that unfortunately or fortunately, I'm not sure which is really part and parcel of the process. So and acknowledged and in fact, actually, I don't think anyone um, at least in this council ever criticized or denounced people for not speaking um, because people have said that they were concerned that they were their opinion would be met with uh, demonstrable rejection. I understand that. I know that. And there were, uh, in, in the security camera debate, there were business owners who were concerned about the viability of their businesses, basically. I got letters from them. <coughs> or I talked to them personally. They did not go unheard. It didn't, and despite some suggestions that they had, they did not. And so I think that's another important message to convey. There are lots of ways of advancing your thoughts and opinions. Um, and it, you know, I, in the course of that same debate that I'm just referring to by as an example, not as a prompt, but the um, there were actually sharp criticisms of the way this uh, the way the sponsors of the ordinance had conducted the process on on the floor mm -hmm. and from the audience. It was true. I, I mean, they did it in a different way, but it was just as, it was just as incisive. Um, so it is the nature of a debate. It is the very essence of a debate. You have opposing points, and they're not just two sides. There's a side represented by every person, every sentient creature in a room. They all have each emotional investment in one particular aspect of any, any debate. But that's how debates work, and it's how we develop consensus, or how we create law, and it is inelegant and um, exciting, actually, for and me anyway. And that's my perversion, I'm sorry. And, and speaking of uh, the debate, I would like to bring us to a vote sooner or later, uh, but not before first calling for any final comments. Um, if not, oh, Councilor Nash. So are we gonna vote on these the entirety of of you know all four or are we going to do them individually <clears throat> on the floor are is the entirety of the proposed rule change right uh, from the debate that I've heard it doesn't sound like it would be inappropriate to vote on the whole order but Councilor Dwight well, do you have an well, opinion as we said before uh, if anyone <laughs> proposes an amendment to these then those should be taken separately I would imagine if we want to separate it out if um, we can vote on them the whole, or if somebody wants to amend any particular item, then we can separate that. But I think as it stands now, it's on, on, on the order as a whole. Now the motion is on the approval of uh, these rule amendments, all of them. So, Councilor Bibble. I, I just like to say one, one, one more thing. Having, having listened carefully uh, and, and having um, taken to heart uh, the 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 sincere commitments of my colleagues here to uh particularly the the council president to uh really use the committee process um to uh formulate policy to study issues uh and the the commitment to engage in uh, a meaningful conversation to be determined about establishing priorities for for this <coughs> legislative priorities for this body uh, and for the city and perhaps most importantly I, I, I take the council president at his word uh, that he will use his his discretion to create an environment that really is welcoming of all views um, and to use his discretion to assure that all present here can be seen and heard um, I, I think I think the, the, the this this lengthy conversation has brought me to a point of 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 comfort in in thinking that the important lessons here have been heard and digested, and uh, I'm 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 going to be comfortable with uh, uh, and I hope I'm not surprising my co-sponsors here, but I'm I'm going to be comfortable with with supporting. Given everything that we've heard and the commitments that we've heard from our council president, I'm going to be supportive of of, 
of deleting these amendments and sticking with what we with 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 what we had. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, Point of order, just so sure. <clears throat> the vote is not to delete the amendments. The vote is on the amendments. Right. The vote is on the amendments, right. and so we have a, a roll call. Six votes will be required to uh, pass the order and um, amend the rules as indicated. Fewer than six votes uh, will mean no changes are made to the rules. I personally will be voting uh, no. So, any any I, question I about a, that? I have a question. Go ahead. So, um, what we have from we're voting on what what came to us from what we did in legislative matters. Is that, am I correct? No, nope, we no. are on the floor. Oh, is okay. the order? And I uh, have that uh, that as well. Yep. So we're voting on whether to accept this, and we're not considering we're not considering the item as it came amended from legislative matters at all, or not at this moment. That's correct. Okay. Um, someone could move to replace one with the other, but I thought it was cl clearer and fairer to, to go off the original order, especially because the amendment would essentially delete the original order. So the order before us is the, uh, the proposal that's come from the sponsors. So, go, Councilor Dwight. To, to, to basically distill it, a no vote essentially uh, renders the same decision that came out of legislative matters. A no vote results in no changes to the rules. Well, may I ask, because out of legislative matters, we also had the deletion of the, le I, of I know, the legislative I know. priorities. <laughs> so that's what, say that. I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, it just... <laughs> So does that mean we're going to take that matter up in a, in a subsequent I don't think we have to we... so far as that it's already deleted. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So, so we were talking about deleting something that's already there. Thank you. Councilor Shara and Councilor Nash. So in that case, can I move to replace it with the original rules? You don't have to because if it fails, no changes will be made to the rules. I understand. But may I still move that? But then we're just voting to have the rules that we have. It's no different. That's okay. Could do that. That's personally, I, I think that's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. You certainly can make the motion, but you would you would make the motion to okay. adopt making, the rules we already have. Are you making the motion to take from legislative matters? What? Just, I'm just saying, repeating what had just been said, which is that you could make a motion to just replace it with um, maybe what was was recommended by legislative matters you could also make a motion i guess to withdraw it right yes you could um yep that's the answer to that councillor nash did you have a question well now i'm confused as I to what we're gonna do <laughs> so <laughs> look let me, look here, here's how it is we have an order on the floor that if it passed it would make various amendments to the council rules that we spent <laughs> two hours discussing um if it does not pass, then those amendments will not be made, and the rules that we have on, on the books will remain unamended. Okay, I can speak to that real quick. Go right ahead. So um, uh, I, I, I am with Councillor Bidwell on the, the fruitful discussion that's gone on here, and that um, I feel we've tended to all of the, the, the concerns, and that I am going to vote no for the changes. And, um, and the, the last thing I'd like to do is to uh, thank everybody who showed up at Legislative Matters and the people who've been involved in this process, that um, it, it's evidence that referring things to committee is a good thing. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Any other procedural questions? So six votes are required. A no vote means to retain the rules as they already exist. So I would be voting no. Uh, so I'll ask for a roll call. Councilor Shera. No. Councilor Bidwell. No. Councilor Carney. No. Councilor Dwight. No. Councilor Klein. No. Councilor Labarge. No. Councilor Nash. No. Councilor O'Donnell. No. Uh, so the, the order fails, and um, we will...
Uh, now move to 18.029 in order to designate certain school employees as special municipal employees. This is the second reading. Is there a motion to approve this? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on this order? Uh, roll call. Um, Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor LaFarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Not correct. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Okay, that's passed unanimously. Um, let's just quickly take items B, C, and D together as a group. Um, this is 18.036, an ordinance to amend a certain table of, of use uh, to do commercial storage and zoning. 18.037, an ordinance to reformat um, a, a, the GI table and other minor changes within zoning. And 18.038, an ordinance to reformat the OI table and allow flexible, his, flexible reuse of historic mill buildings in the zoning code. Um, it would be in order to refer these to legislative matters. Is there a motion to move do that? To refer to legislate. Oh, uh, to move as a group. Great. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Made and seconded. Any discussion on the referral? If not all in favor, please say aye. Opposed, aye. no. Aye. They're referred. Final item is 17.379, uh, an ordinance relative to parking on Prospect Street. This came with a positive recommendation from the Transportation Parking Commission. Positive recommendation from legislative <coughs> matters um, with amendments. Uh, this ordinance, um, unless there's any objection, I will waive the reading and simply describe it. This ordinance, as amended, would establish three 15-minute parking spaces on Prospect Avenue, um, right in Prospect Street. <coughs> oh, excuse me, Prospect Street. That's right, around the corner from Prospect Avenue. Uh, fi three 15-minute spaces in the location indicated by uh, the square colored boxes. Um, it is right in front of Meadowlark Child Care and across the street from the YMCA, both institutions, a very hectic time uh, at certain times of the day with parking, with pickups and drop-offs. The purpose of this ordinance is to establish three spaces that allow people doing the pickups and drop-offs to cycle through more quickly. It should be noted that farther up, uh, because of closing a curb cut in front of uh, that building next to Murphy Terrace, we do have room to paint three ad additional parking spaces which don't exist right now. So in a sense, the 15-minute spaces are being replaced by the new spaces, so there's no net loss. Um, I think it makes both of these institutions and stakeholders uh, in both Ward 1 and Ward 2 happier, and it came with a positive recommendation from the Transportation and Parking Commission. So is there a motion to approve um, the order? So approved. Second. Ordinance? Made by Councilor Bidwell, seconded by Councilor Dwight. Um, <clears throat> I'd like a motion to amend it as recommended by the DPW and the Legislative Matters Committee. Uh, so moved. Is there a second? Um, good. Any discussion on the amendment? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Let's know the amendment is adopted to back to the original amended order. Any discussion on what we're doing here? Councilor Dwight and then Councilor Bidwell. Uh, the one concern I express in, in Legislative Matters, of course, is originally these books. There was a limited time proposed for these 15 minutes when it would be enforced. Um, but we do not have a prescriptive law currently on the books that would find that, so it would default to the standard 15-minute uh, parking rules that expire at 6, as I understand. That's right. There was some discussion about having only certain times of day apply. I think what the DPW recommended ultimately was that, if I had to guess, I think it stems from the fact that they don't have to buy unusual signs. So it would apply all day long. Any concerns about that, particularly from the Ward 1 or Ward, ward 2 counselors? Well, only that I thought we had a fairly carefully crafted solution that made a lot of sense to all the parties. And I would hate to see it disrupted okay. by failure to, by unwillingness to just uh, change the template for printing of signs. If, if I'm hearing you correctly. So I hear that as a motion to continue with the expectation that we'll discuss it with the DPW <laughs> before the next meeting. I would support that be Good. because, um, yes, I, I, I like the solution before. Good. So we've amended it, which is progress. Uh, is there a second to continue at the next regular meeting? Yes. Second by Councilor LaBarge. Any discussion on the continuance? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 No, it is continued. No new business today. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. I think it's like this, that everyone is aware of that there are countries and there are areas where girls have great difficulties. They are stopped when they go to school, you know, and it's, it's, it's disgusting. But in the majority of the world, where most people in the world live, most countries, girls today go to school as long as boys, more or less. Eh? That doesn't mean that gender equity is achieved, not at all. They still, still are confrontated to terrible, terrible limitations. But schooling is there in the world today. Now, we miss the majority. When you answer, you answer according to the worst places. And there you are right, but you miss the majority. What about poverty? Well, it's, it's very clear that poverty here was almost halved. And in US, when we asked the public, only 5% got it right. Huh? And you? Ah, uh, you.